Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Monday, December 16th, 2019. Uh, we have an extensive uh, agenda, and the first part of it is executive session pursuant to Mass General Law to conduct the strategy sessions and preparations for negotiations and non-union personnel, and we will convene an open session afterwards. So I need a motion. Move the Board of Selectmen vote pursuant to Master Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A2 to go into executive session to conduct strategy in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and to convene an open session thereafter. Second. Second. Ms. Napoli? Aye. Mr. Gose? Aye. Mr. Baby? Mr. Knox? Aye. And we'll be back right afterwards. Back to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Monday, December 16th. On the agenda tonight, uh, we have department board updates from the town administrator, the appointment of our new assistant town administrator, uh, snow and ice budget and master plan implementation committee, if I can get that out, chaired by Mike Zeldin. Uh, around 650 public input, well, maybe an update on ACA. Uh, after that, item number five is a public hearing application for transfer of all alcohol uh, restaurant license from Rudy Patel and Dave Incorporated doing business as Chip Shots to, uh, to CAD Incorporated. Uh, Chip Shots, Kristen M. Ferrante as proposed license manager, common victims license, entertainment and automatic amusement. Uh, item number six is application for change of manager of all alcohol beverage uh, restaurant license. Chapman Inco Incorporated doing businesses as Masala Bay Indian Kitchen at 501 Constitution Avenue. Proposed manager is Hermander Gill. Uh, number, item number seven is a joint meeting with the Finance Committee, Internal Control Audit Budget by Clifton Lawson Allen. And part B is fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget discussion. Item number eight is the Finance Department review by the Technical Assistant Bureau. Item number eight. In a continuation of a public hearing, uh, Selectman's Regulations Policies, Chapter 8, Earth Removal reg Regulations at 64 Spectacle Pond Road. Item number 10 is a tax increment financing proposal for the new hotel at the point, followed by uh, minutes. Mr. Clerk, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nina, you want to go through the mail? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we received a letter from the Department of Housing and Community Development regarding the subsidized inventory, housing inventory update. Uh, Marin Tuhill, our town planner, and Diane Crory, our town clerk, are working on this update. Uh, we received a letter from MassDOT regarding salting at the commuter rail crossing. DPW Director Chris Stoddard is aware of this provision and um, will ensure that the department is as careful as possible. Uh, the tax rate approval notification, we received uh, the approval from the Department of Revenue's Division of Local Services. That was all that was in the packet. Thank you. Item 3A, uh, new town assistant administrator to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If uh, th through the board, I'd like to invite uh, Joe Layden uh, here to possibly say a few words uh, regarding his background. As the board knows, uh, Mr. Layden has about 20 years experience in municipal government, predominantly in the planning field and now as a community development director for the town of Grafton. So, M Mr. Chairman, through you, if I may. Hello. Hello, Joe. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really excited about joining uh, the town of Littleton. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, the town has prided and identified as far as wanting to preserve uh, agricultural uh, heritage and dealing with uh, growth issues associated with uh, commuting into Boston, 495 commuter rail that I have a lot of direct experience with in the communities that I've worked for. 
uh, and was really impressed when I uh, saw the position and started doing research on the town and really uh, felt that it was a good fit as far as where I've been professionally as, as well as um, my experience and, and what the, the town was looking for. Thank you. I was like when Glavin and I had the ability to do be at all interviews and I'll speak for myself I just thought you did an outstanding job during during that time you, you spoke well and you knew some of the things that we were going through you did your research so we were very happy with that and I'll open up to any questions that the board may have no questions we weren't at all the interviews just the initial one but uh, very impressed with Joe's uh, resume and with the way he presented himself uh, the day we met him and uh, I can easily see him not only being a great fit in our town hall which um, succeeds tremendously by working together well and I think Joe will fit into that, uh, that model well so uh, can't wait to see what um, his talents bring to the table in terms of our ability to move forward with our agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just love the fact that you have complementary skills to our, to our town administrator and to our existing staff. I think, uh, I think you guys have been a great team and look forward to working together. Welcome. Thank I had you. a little bit of time with Joe before, prior to tonight's meeting and, and got to hear a little bit more about his background and experience, especially in planning. I think there's a lot of areas um, with his experience that will be a great fit for what we currently have before us for the town of Littleton. So it's exciting to have you on board. Welcome. Thank you. You guys have stolen everything. Welcome, <laughs> Joe. I'm <laughs> excited to have you come on board. <laughs> Well, the best part, too, you're coming into a town that's very quiet. There's nothing going on. Every, <laughs> everything's caught up. Uh, Lots of yeah, there's, there's like no cars, no traffic at 5 o'clock. You can it's sit quiet. back in that chair and just... What are you doing Wednesday? We've got an economic development meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I would look for a motion, then. Okay. And uh, move that the Board of Selectmen vote uh, to confirm the appointment of Mr. Joseph Layden as Assistant Town Administrator, subject to a successful background check. Second. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Good to see you again. Hello. Nice Welcome again. aboard. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Actually, Nina, if you want to take a break, you just let him. That sounds, <laughs> right, right. That sounds That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you ready? <laughs> well, sure. The last guy did. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's test him out right away. <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Okay, three B, Mr. Snow and Ice. Stop eat at some point. <laughs> Look at you. I'm gonna go home and have a snack. Have a snack. Have a big one. <laughs> right. Good thinking. Um, yeah. So we're not quite out of money yet, but I'm a little nervous that <laughs> we will be by the time you have a next December what? Another selectmen's meeting. And well, when we put this on the agenda, we weren't hardly supposed to get any snow tomorrow, but now we are. So I probably will be out of money. So I need to. Have you authorize us so we can deficit spend? This happens pretty much this time every year, within a week or two, usually. Last year, I think it was the first week of January. The year before, say, we were was... hoping to get to January. Okay. Well, we can roll the dice. But <laughs> if it comes up, then we can't plow. Seven to three. Well, actually, last December we hardly had anything. It was set in January. Yeah, it was. We were like the second week of January last year. I think the year before it was early. We had a snowstorm at Jim, for Jim's retirement party. That was in November last year. <laughs> hmm. Any questions from the board? Sure. Yeah. I move that the Board of Select move out pursuant to MGL Chapter 44, Section 31D to approve incurring expenses in excess of the available appropriation for snow and, snow and ice removal for fiscal year 2020. Sorry. Motion to be made in the second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thanks. Careful out there. Right. Thanks, Chris. And what's the latest, anyway? Two to four? Four to seven. Really? Yeah. With ice, right? Yeah. When, when did that happen? Uh, about 4.30 this afternoon. Oh. We'll get another update today. So we'll Later in the day, is that when it's coming? Or? During the day, yeah. yeah. So we, we'll uh, see you at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., hopefully. 
we appreciate it today. To I saw advantage. that. Yeah. To hopefully take yeah. advantage of saving us um, from having to bring him in on overtime. In Great. Morning, so. it worked. It's worked in the past, so we're hoping that it'll work today. Hopefully, if the snow starts a little bit later, we'll be can take advantage of that. So. The, the pre treating is essentially what? I, I, icing the road? Oh, the uh, salting the road? Yes, yes. Well, yeah, we I, mean, I saw that on news. Yeah. I was just wondering how that worked. And it, yeah, we salt the road because it, it allows it, when the snow first starts to fall, it basically just turns it into a liquid so it doesn't freeze on contact. Last year, we were able to have the crews hold off coming in four or five storms because of us being able to do this. So um, we're hoping again for tomorrow. Yeah, so right. We'll see. But. Yeah, about six inches. I'm going to blame you if I can get to work tomorrow. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Item number 3C, Master Plan Implementation Committee Update with Mr. Mike Zeldin. You want to take it away? And I'll take it away. Okay. Uh, Good evening, and thank you very much for making time on your agenda. My name is Michael Zeldin. I'm the chairman of the Master Plan Implementation Committee, and this is an update, as the slide indicates. Um, about two and a half years ago, the master plan was accepted and adopted by the, the town. Uh, it was obviously, the plan itself is a, uh, a, <clears throat> a fairly accurate re uh, reflection of how the town, where the town wants to go, where the people made their selections and priorities. And uh, one of the first things I did uh, was began getting asked for advice and input from others who had been through the process before, both in town and outside. And I have many slides about the advice, which I'm not going to share at this time because I need them for subsequent updates. But I did get one piece of advice um, that I just want to mention, and that was that, uh, which, I, which I think applies to tonight, and that is that if progress is being made in an implementation plan, actually things are getting done, keep the presentation short. If on the other hand there's been no progress made, cut that time in half. So tonight I'm going to be giving you a brief update. You have in front of you, I believe, a, um, a summary of the major activities under the master plan, which is most of what the town has been doing for quite a while, uh, as a printout. And I'm not going to go through that list because most of you have either been part of or have or know about these activities. Um, the current status is that progress is being made, and there is the other point I want to make about the progress, which I'll get into in it briefly in a moment, is there's been really persistent, constant support by residents and stakeholders. <clears throat> and that, by the way, that's the title of the particular item that you want to look at. Uh, it's, I think, two or three pages long. Uh, it makes a lovely slide, but I think most of you know what's in there. Um, I, I just want to summarize sort of a capsule of what the town residents have voted for in support at town meeting. This is important for us, for all of us, both for committees and boards that have statutory responsibility and others who provide input, advice, or ignored or not. Uh, to understand what's going on, and that is that if you look at the list and what the town has done through the last, and when I say the town, I mean the residents, all of us, is that they've tackled one of the most difficult issues of all is housing, and some of them very successfully. We have, for example, on Weber, uh, the Weber Village on King Street, it looks as if there's a good chance of getting housing there that not, that not only services or it will be attractive to the senior population, which has been after housing, but also hopefully at price points that some seniors can really afford. And this is important, but we're within shooting distance of this. And it's important that we do this. This, has, this is a shovel in the ground operation. The second one is that there's already been, and I'm, I'm taking note of this because if it's, if it's town-wide significance, and that is the town's invested money already, thanks to the residents in system design, as well as specifying the location for components for the sewer for the common. And what happens with the common has widespread uh, impact on the rest of the town. None of these things can be separated. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust has become established and has become operational. There's been funding for the library construction. We're going to have a new library, which then opens up how this building gets used. A, a, a difficult problem, a difficult issue. The uh, town water supply, a major concern of residents in this town, has been well, the water supply has been, shall we say, well protected. 
Uh, and you have responded, as, as the town has, has also responded, in providing funding to make sure that we keep that. So you, you begin to see, I think as reflected in uh, the new assistant town manager's comment, and we all know that, that Littleton wants to preserve, enhance, what we call the farm environment, the farm sense of place. At the same time, we're moving into the 21st century and things are changing. And this, we have, the town has looked for ways in which to preserve and sustain, and at the same time, marshal its forces for change. What I have in front of you is an example, and I'm going to be coming back to you. This is also, if it's not a handout, I have them here. Actually, it's going to get used twice. Let's pass this around if you would. This one's in color. I decided to give you a little excitement for the night. <clears throat> All this, what this is, is that the, there was a roadmap created for the development of the, excuse me, the revitalization of the common uh, some time ago. And I thought this was a very good way to give you an idea, not only what's, what's going on in the common, but also the concept of sequence and the relationship between the various components that can't go seriatim. Some of them need to be coordinated. And now the very first two, I want to take a look. There is going forward at the moment, nearly finished hopefully, is uh, a refreshment and zoning for re uh, revitalization. Uh, the technique being used, you, as you probably all know, is form-based code. And the planning board uh, has been very persistent and, and along with the town at their hearings to get this refined in a place where Littleton can actually use it to good effect. At the same time, and I want you to look at green infrastructure, the process of getting prepared for installing a sewering system that will open up and change the way the land is used, the way property is used in the common. So when the zoning arrives, hopefully next year, <coughs> next year at the town meetings, hopefully so will be the necessary funds to push the sewering. These two can easily go in concert. The other components should be started soon, and that has to do with communicating, this is a public outreach, about what it means to revitalize the common. Now, I am very well aware that most residents, not necessarily all, have some notion that we're revitalizing the common or wish to. However, two and a half years is a long time. People are very busy. So in the next several months, for, and I'll be happy to elaborate slightly later on, I'm looking forward for all relevant committees and boards to join in and make it clear to the public at large the benefits. For example, one of them, even though it's focused on the, on the common, it, the, the sewering and all the other infrastructure as well as what goes above ground has a profound effect on how housing is and how dense our housing is and more importantly how diverse our housing can be. By focusing on the common and places like it, for example, the area near the, the train depot, it is very possible to see how Littleton can, in the course of the next several years, diversify the housing stock, including price points for a variety of possible new residents, as well as existing ones. So the effect of the common, the effect of, of doing something near the train station goes beyond the obvious. It affects the town. And this, this concept, I think, is an important one. I, I think most of us here, regardless, is, is it obvious, but it's, I think it makes it easier or more clear to the public to understand that this is the kind, they, in their wisdom, this is where they're heading. This is simply to make sure that all of you know that I enjoy color, too. <laughs> all right, some, now there's something very interesting emerges from this again. Uh, this is from, these are, project features, what they're trying to achieve. First of all, if you go between one and two, you, very, you see very clearly these are fairly interesting projects with, again, far-reaching effects. Private property, in the common, there are a whole collection of different private property owners. And they're facing and embracing not only a refreshed zoning, but also the idea of having a sewer system that will allow them to make better use both for themselves and hopefully for the rest of the town as a result of better land use is the best way to put it. There's also the opportunity, which I understand has already started out in conversations privately among some of the property owners, 
to pursue mixed use and diversify our housing at some density that the town has already expressed some limits to. And what I mean has expressed it is during the formation of the, <clears throat> of, of, of the roadmap for the common, it was very clear what the limits of tolerance were for density of housing by residents. And that's shown in what's called scenario three, which shows a certain level, I think it's approximately between 80 to 90, a one and two bedroom apartment types in the common. That's, that doesn't solve the housing problem in Littleton. It begins approaching it. And there are other sites that are coming on board. Again, hopefully this would include Foster's, the area near the train station. Again, number two, if you look at what they have in common, including the opportunity to introduce amenities in the mixed use, they also will, re will require and have to address, address town parking as well. So when you look at these two components here, you see some of the major elements that characterize what Littleton is today, what it's becoming, and some of the challenges it faces. And where we are is that we have two areas that can take the pressure off of housing pressure on what Littleton really treasures a great deal, and that is open space, space between neighbors, space between neighbors, stress, uh, green space, so that we're not, as it were, replicating cities or large urban areas. Number three is a completely different, but it has something in common with one and two. That's the town hall building. I'm just multi-use, public service. This is what this building will, will be used for one way or another, public service. This reflects accurately what the town is after for this building and includes, and so it joins the other concerns in town, housing, the long list of which you've seen, transportation, which I'll come back to, and resources, which, cons which consist of two. Revenue, what, revenue what, what projects do we have that, revenue, that generate revenue for us? And number two, quality of life, which includes what is the sense of place in Littleton? All three of these projects exemplify nearly all the projects that are going on in Littleton. And that's why I'm saying we have progress and why it's important that there's support so far that the town has provided to all of us that we do what we can to sustain it by making clear what we're doing going forward. So this is why I got to the road ahead. There is a, uh, a, another handout I hope you have, which basically, let me see if I have included here. Yes, it's, it's this handout is titled 2019 Master Plan Implementation Committee Goals. And what this simply expresses is the background and thinking that goes into the formulation of goals, which we submitted to uh, the, uh, the Board of Selectmen and the town administrator in August. So there, there are no surprises in it. The two main components is we're basically going to continue what we've been doing, and that is working with other committees and organizations, such as you, who have actually the ability to implement, because MPEC does no implementation itself. That depends on the Board of Selectmen, the town, and the, and the planning board. You have the statutory authority, as it were, to, to allow, to permit, to fund actual construction, actual change in policy, et cetera. So <clears throat> in, order, in order to accomplish the objectives, including making clear and informing the public about what's going on with respect to the common and as, as deemed appropriate for other projects, MPIC is also going to undertake a series of, of forums during the course of the, of the next year. This is why I'm here, in addition to everything else, promoting, I'm requesting funds uh, from the planning board and hopefully with your approval as well for a request for $10,000 which will be used as the, as the handout indicates to pay for rental of the space, uh, some, some degree of re refreshment and if necessary highly specialized speakers uh, if required. But by and large we hope to use, now that we've been through this a couple of times, people within the professional staff, hopefully the new uh, administrator uh, and the administrator to basically give an overall picture, not only of where we are, but where we are heading and why there are benefits from the various initiatives that the town itself has asked to be initiated. So that's the basis for the, for the request for 10,000. Here, again, I'm showing for the second time the roadmap. And the reason for this is, is that I'm suggesting this 
as a useful tool to be used for any major, what we'll call neighborhood building. And that's what we're doing in the common. This is extremely useful. And one of them I want to emphasize here because we've already covered a few of these. One of them is economic incentives, and the other is transportation. <coughs> and the reason I'm mentioning this, I hope we'll, uh, there will be time to explain why these are important, is under economic incentives, th this is another classification of what could be called uh, loosely economic development. What economic incentives really mean is what can we do to assist and promote in the common the arrival of those kinds of businesses, including retail as well as tech or other kind of businesses that bring jobs to the town, however modest that boost may be. And by the way, the, the common is not the only place where this can occur. The point is, is that when do you start this process of looking at it? The answer seems to be from the input I've gotten from other towns is as early as now. And I'm very glad to see that we have someone, I'm, I'm really glad you're here, <laughs> who has some experience, and I'm hoping the two of you can join in, along with the rest of us, in putting together a set of policies, aims, that would have to come from this board about what is it that comprises economic development for this town, and how do we go about getting it. That's not MPIC's job, let me make it clear. What, what our committee has determined and feels very strongly is that this particular area has been not been paid attention to. I know it gets mentioned, but there's been no progress really made to, to decide this is what economic development is, this is how it should go about. We should go about it. So far, so I'm calling on you, please think about this and move on. Now, in order to help this along, and I'll, I'll get to this slide in a moment, um, I had hoped that uh, uh, Carolyn Armstrong, who is the new uh, chairman of the Economic Development Committee, would be here tonight, but she had a previous business appointment and couldn't make it. But we've been working together for the last several weeks because she, as the new chairman, wants to push the process along. Now, like most committees in town, most of the members have not one, but sometimes two jobs, children. They have lives, and they can't, they're all volunteers as you are. And there are sometimes when things get slowed up. <coughs> she had to attend. So we work together on a proposal, a copy of which is in front of you, for a total of $35,000. And the purpose of this is to begin the process for them, for the uh, Economic Development Committee, to begin the process of offering to the Board of Selectmen and other interested boards what should economic development in this town look like with a focus on such things as manufacturing maybe or what could, could go in the common. The idea here, frankly, is by proposing this and proposing a certain, putting a certain price on it, that you'll understand how serious the new chair of the Economic Development Committee and MPIC take this particular topic. I noticed tonight you have a topic on this, on your list tonight that, that directly relates to economic development. So make no mistake, here's an opportunity here to see, and I'm sure you do have some policy thoughts, here's an opportunity for, again to renew your effort in this particular area. So the details of the proposal that uh, Carol and I put together are uh, in your hands. Uh, I hope that you'll find a way to approve the funding because the planning board feels that this is more in your shall we say, portfolio that it is theirs. Uh, I'm not going to argue the point. I'll be very happy to go through it and explain what's going on. And also, if you decide that you wish to go forward, you may decide this is not enough. It needs help from the state. Uh, Carol and I have talked about this, about the necessity if they do go, do make an application for funds, that that application for funds is large enough so that the burden carried by the town for administrative support is not, again, just another item for the administration and for you to be concerned about at high level. So whatever is decided to be done, I'm hopeful that you will join in that effort. There is one item that I want to now bring to your attention going forward that's on MPIC's <coughs> list of things for, shall we say, the upcoming <coughs> season, and that is item number 59, which has been sitting on this list and mentioned several times 
at least by me and several other members who have played of MPIC who have been liaison with the appropriate committees, and that is to establish mechanisms and policies that link the implementation of the master plan, <coughs> annual work plans, budgets, and capital projects. Now, this does not mean what would I call reactive financing analysis, where a project is put on and a cost is associated with it, and then FinCom and you and some of the other folks start work start working on it and trying to wonder and trying to determine is it worthwhile, what's the payoff. I'm suggesting I would like to see FinCom and to the extent possible FinCom and to the extent possible this board undertake with the help of, of town administrator a technique of looking at economic impact for the projects before they get funded, before in other words, provide an estimate, which is very, it turns out fairly, not easy to get, but possible on some of the projects going forward for town, and indicate what does it cost, what's the benefit flowing back both with respect to revenue and benefit to the town. For example, the, the, I'll, I'll use again because it also applies to the area around the station, but the common is an example of an investment. It's not simply like the Providing funds for the, for the library represents an investment of where you get basically social capital back for that. It's a very good investment to make for that reason. Common has the advantage of not only social capital coming back, but also because of the way it can be financed, it finances itself. Because, if you put, because of the presence of a, of a sewer, <clears throat> entrepreneurs and property owners in town can arise from their deep slumber and begin making more, shall we say, of their, of their properties, which also will affect revenue for the town, and more importantly, hopefully, jobs, which most of you understand, I think, that jobs actually are more powerful than the, shall we say, the tax revenues that come from a company. It comes from their employees. And no, you can see this very easily already at the point I'm not suggesting for a moment that either of the two major projects we're looking at comes in that same scale because it's not a, a, night, a hill filled with all retail. It's, it's mixed, but it gives us an opportunity to diversify where revenues come from and where social benefit accrues. I've already indicated to you uh, what I feel is, is appropriate to start the discussion about uh, the uh, looking at economic development at your, at your convenience and to get the Economic Development Committee to assist you by providing them $35,000 to begin, as it were, their own process. I'd like to bring a closure to understand some of the thinking that has guided <clears throat> what is going on in this town. This is what I believe the town residents have come to understand. They're maybe even slightly ahead of some of the boards and committees in towns this way. They understand, I think, very clearly that Littleton is part, it's actually in, it's at the edge of, it's called a super city. It's a super city metro, which Boston is. It's one of the five in the United States. <coughs> Mysteriously, they're all at the coasts. We're ranked, generally in most rankings, as being number five, and we're one of the five that contribute a significant amount to the gross national product of this country. Inside 128, and I'm just being arbitrary with this because it's also based up with the fact, that's where you see innovation. That's the engine. That's the engine that's driving all of this. What has happened, though, is that the other items you see on this slide, if you leave out innovation base, because I can't claim that Littleton, sitting on the edge of where it is, is, quote, innovation based. But look at these diagnostics. Look at these features. How many times have we heard about how, housing costs, lack of diversity of housing in, the, in our town, transportation issue? And the reason I mentioned congested traffic is because it affects how people search for and decide where they're going to live. We hold these things in common with all the other towns that surround Boston because of what we'll call the inside 28 effect, which is a centripetal effect. In other words, they pull in the jobs both into Boston and to some extent north of Boston, north of us, leaving us with the remaining four that are on this list. I don't mean leaving, these are the consequences. 
This is an oversimplified model. This is what I think the town residents understand. They understand this, they participate in it. This is where their livelihoods come from, but at the same time they want what is called what was called out in the master plan a great place to live. And that's what the master plan is is for, and that's where the progress has been made. On the right hand side I called semi-urban. It merely describes anything inside of 128, where there are both jobs and many as a result of many different kinds of companies, diverse tax sources. Some people live in, the, in such urban areas that go outside to get their jobs. But the main advantage, that, the main event that's going on is the so-called semi-urban inside 128 have a greater opportunity to diversify and meet the growing expenses for housing that they face. We are more like the left side, the community model, where our main source of revenue and very frankly are what we depend on for a quality of life, which I've already tried to define for you as uh, as where, what the sense Littleton residents have of the town, we are almost entirely residential tax source dependent. It's almost, an, it's, it's, although we do have some industry here, by and large the burden falls on taxpayers. On the other hand, approximately 90 or more percent of Littleton residents get up in the morning, get in their cars, take a train, take a bus, whatever, find their jobs elsewhere but what they want to come home to is not where they work. What, what they want to come home to is what we're trying to build with the master plan. However, they need transportation, they need housing, and they want the services that go along with it. And I believe that the town, by and large, understands this and is willing, to, as it were, to participate in its acquisition. So in that sense, I hope that you found what I've presented here useful. Maybe this helps put it in context. But I believe this is one of the, as it were, driving elements. I'm not sure if we'll escape from this, let's say, within the next 20 years. It could, it could very well be. But all I have to say is that at the moment, this is where Littleton is at. We're in a very good position. We're in a very, very good position by following the, the, the plan that the town has decided they wanted to follow, to be able to address transportation, housing, and services, and yes, preserve the lifestyle that we have here in Littleton. With that, hopefully I've consumed too much of your time, and take questions. Um, right argue. now, I have a public hearing that I have to open up. Um, I, I hope you're gonna stay, because I'm, I'm asking there's people here that wanna ask you questions. Fine, I'll stay, okay. no problem. Okay, we'll come back to you as soon as the public hearing is done. Mr. Clark, would you? If it's okay with everyone, I'm going to uh, move to waive the reading in the public hearing. Okay. Jeff. I would suggest we actually open. The, like, let me just oh, pull this yeah. up really quick. You'd like to open it? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. So move. Uh, move that we open the hearing for the application for transfer of the all alcohol restaurant license from Rudy Patel and Dave Inc. doing business as Chip Shots Pub to KAD Incorporated doing business as Chip Shots for 245 Air Road, Littleton, Mass. And Second. common victual license, entertainment license, automatic, automatic amusement devices as well, please. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, those in second. All those in favor, open the committee. Aye. Aye. Uh, I move to waive the reading of the hearing notice for the transfer of the all-alcohol restaurant license uh, from Maruti Patel and Dave Inc. doing business as Chip Shots Pub to transfer KAD Incorporated doing business as Chip Shots and the Common Vic license, entertainment license, and automatic amusement devices for KAD Incorporated doing business as Chip Shots. Second. Motion been made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're open. That's great. <laughs> Good evening, Brian Burke. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? For, uh, for Carlo and uh, Kristen Ferrante, who are going to be not only the local uh, residents from the town of Littleton, but now they're going to be business owners as well uh, once this is approved. So I, I first ask, ask if you have any questions. I know that everyone uh, has an idea who Carlo is and Kristen, and they're going to be great. Uh, Businessman in the community. Carlo has about 35 years worth of experience in the restaurant industry. 
in his last 10 years was at um, the Skybox in Tewksbury. We had a successful venture where we took a tired, worn establishment and brought it back to life and made it very uh, uh, profitable and productive in the, in the community there. So I'm pretty sure that he's going to be able to do the same thing and take his energy and innovation and do the same for chip shops as well. Would you like to come up here? Would you like to come up? Sure. Yeah, bring mm -hmm. Welcome and uh, I'll give us a background on maybe things that you might want to be doing there or changes that might be made. Uh, I think first and foremost I'm going to get in there and you know, do my homework. Uh, I've got a lot of ideas what I want to do. Um, but first and foremost I want to check out uh, you know, what's going on there now. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, you know, uh, employment, employees, um, you know, and ideas of, uh, I have a lot of ideas as far as food, um, and I just have to figure out what, what's best for that environment. Um, you know, as Brian said, uh, I took the skybox into an old place and brought it more into an, uh, a more modernized uh, environment uh, in Tewksbury, Mass. Um, and we did well. I just recently sold it um, in uh, on February 28th of 2019, and I've been dying to get into ship shots for the last probably three to five years, um, and I think I'm lucky enough to finally get it. Um, and uh, I've been prying that place to try to get it to me uh, for quite a while. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there's a lot of work to do uh, as far as what I want to do there. Um, both physically and, uh, you know, uh, the mental part of that place, too. So uh, I'd like to change it around. It's going to take a while, you know, um, but um, I have confidence that uh, we can do it. Do you plan to make any, any, will it be closed at all while you make these changes, or will you stay open? Well, I, I did the same thing at the Skybox, and I didn't, I don't think I closed one day. So, you know, you figured out a way to just... You know, get it done uh, four hours, after hours, whatever it is. Uh, sometimes even during, you close off a section, work on that section. Uh, you know, I don't want to lose money by closing, that's for sure. Questions to the board? The uh, reputation of both Carlo at Skybox and the Dufo family and their businesses in Littleton uh, uh, leave me with great expectation that this is going to be a big success. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we got uh, feedback from the different departments. I actually spoke with the, uh, the police chief on this, and he said he's 100% he's behind it. Um, and from a personal perspective, um, Carlos has been coaching um, lacrosse and football in the community for uh, 18 years, 20 years, more, including oh, yes. youth. Yeah. Um, and he certainly has a positive impact. Uh, he has had a positive impact on, on my kids that have um, been lucky enough to have him as their coach, but he's, uh, he's certainly um, changed lives of a number of kids that have come through him as a coach, and uh, I think uh, he, he would, he and Kristen both would bring that same that flavor and philosophy uh, to running chip shots and be a, a great place for um, locals to work, but also to enjoy. And I think they hold that to a high standard. I look forward to being part of them being able to make that change. Great. Happy to hear you're taking it over. No doubt it'll be a success. Looking forward to seeing what you what you do with it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, sounds great. I'm excited to see what you guys got. And why, why am I always on the back end of this? <laughs> Start Next time, I'll so many, so many platitudes that we can throw around before it just seems. I just think it's great that you have someone from the community that yeah. wants to invest, at, you know, in the, their hometown. So, you know, as being a business owner in the in the town as well, I think it's great. So when you get everybody nodding yes, an old sales manager told me stop selling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just stopped. <laughs> well, I think we're at the. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, just one more thing. I'm probably eventually going to change the name, too, um, because I just kind of want to get away from 
the whole chip shots. An image thing. The image and you know everything else. But, I mean, I, I don't know when, but probably within a year or two, I'm going to change the name. As soon as I figure everything out. We call it Gagos. <laughs> yeah. I'm right down the road now. It's too, <laughs> a little too close to home. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I'd look for a motion. I would suggest well, sure. opening to public yeah, comment public first. Input, yeah. Wait, before uh, we close the area. Oh, yeah. Any public input? <laughs> See, I, I knew there wasn't going to be a meeting. Rob, 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 my only question is, how long do we get to enjoy trivia nights? Because we go play trivia on Tuesday nights. So I'm just curious if you have any plans to do away with that anytime soon. No. Awesome. No. That's all I care about. That's it. That's it. So <laughs> karaoke? Huh? There's don't plenty of karaoke there. <laughs> don't encourage Rob to karaoke. I don't do karaoke. <laughs> I don't do trivia very well either, but I enjoy it. There's some cool here. So moving. Second. Motion has been made and second to close the hearing. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Let's suppose. Okay, any further debate? No questions? Can I move that the Board of Selectmen vote pursuant to MGL Chapter 138, Section 12, to approve the transfer of an all alcohol restaurant license from Rudy Patel and Dave Incorporated, doing business as Chip Shots Pub, to transfer EKAD Incorporated, and doing business as Chip Shots. Manager Kristen M. Ferranti and Common Vic License, Entertainment License, and Automatic Amusement Devices for KAD Incorporated doing business as chip shots Monday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. on the premises described, located at 245 Air Road, Middleton. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Zeldin, would you like to come back up and we'll finish up? And thank you for allowing us to do that. You have no choice. Yeah, we didn't have a choice anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> Mere technicality. Uh, fire away. Questions from the board? I'll start over here. Um, and less a question, more a comment. Um, and I think the idea of continuing to do the public outreach, even at a, a small expense, is really important. And, and here's why. We, we can talk about, we can get 10 people in a room, and nine of them will say, we should revitalize the common. But every one of those nine has a different idea about what revitalization means. And that's, that's where the, the sticky part is. And so we need to simultaneously build consensus among that the, the people who are engaged, as well as gain input and feedback from them so that our boards and committees and so on are, are moving in that direction. And so, you know, the, spending a few dollars to both educate and build consensus with the group of engaged citizens who will, who will show up to those things, I think is money well spent because the, the feedback that we have gotten continuously is that master plans have a tendency to die on the vine. And that's, that's exactly what this is intended to uh, fight against. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I come? Sure, please. Yeah. Uh, just to remind you that uh, there is, in fact, a roadmap, uh, a rather detailed one that came from the town itself post master plan. So, we, to, so basically, we've gone through, <clears throat> I will call, uh, this exercise before. What I appreciate about your comment is that we have a place to start from because the, the level of detail in the, in the we, we develop scenarios, I won't review the whole problem, we develop scenarios and ask folks to, as it were, express their views and the scenarios became the stimulant, as it were, for the, for the response. I, I see that as a good place to start uh, and for, for residents to, as it were, rethink or re-examine, uh, but the basic facts about what's needed to make any revitalization work in the common is a combination of elements, most of which the town, I, I think common sense would indicate uh, that you need certain fundamental elements. How they're positioned, at what level, is, is probably the big question that you're really more, more interested in addressing. Well, I, I guess I don't necessarily agree entirely. I think some folks don't even though we've gotten this far in the process of the master plan through the roadmap, so on and so forth. Um, I, I'm not sure everyone agrees that certain fundamental things that are, are fundamentally required to
to revitalize the common or things that they want to see. So part of this is, is frankly, edu continuing to educate the public and helping them understand that there's going to be a, there are going to be certain things that they're not 100% comfortable with that are vital to achieving what we've collectively identified and even those folks might identify as being really important end goals. And you know, you, you hear certain things, oh, well, I want, I want to see this, but I don't want to see that, right? Well, but you, you can't get this without that. It, you know, take, um, take uh, congestion issues, you know. People want to see more diversity in business and, and greater economic vitality, but they're worried about the traffic concerns, right? So, so marrying those things together and helping folks understand them is, is I think, what the, the, the single biggest deliverable should be from those ongoing sessions. And I think it's worth us spending a few dollars to make that happen, especially if we're putting technical expertise. I mean, Joe, and I don't know if you realized it, but you just got volunteered for a whole bunch of stuff right, right out of the gate. But um, <laughs> Actually, I didn't say this early, but I'll say it now since um, there's been a lot of comments relating to it. Joe's role is going to be actually all the things that we've not, it's going to be human resources and procurement and special projects. It's not to say that he's not going to have special projects in this area, but overwhelmingly we're kind of trying to do that scenario where he takes on the things that um, he would benefit from growing in, and I'm going to take on things that I would benefit from growing in, and, and that would provide both of us the opportunity to, to use one another as, um, you know, resources. Oh, yeah. For sure, no, but just looking at your resume, it's pretty clear, you know, in the planning, it, whether this is something that long-term you're involved in, um, I'm going to imagine you're going to spend a, a half hour giving one of these technical sessions or, or something like that based on your experience and expertise. So. Hi. So thanks for your update, Mike. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate all the time and effort and enthusiasm that you've put into chairing the Master Plan Im Implementation Committee. I sincerely mean that. It is not an easy undertaking. There's so many moving parts to what we have going on here in Littleton. Um, one of the things that I do want to sort of focus on is the direction of the Master Plan Implementation Committee. And it, within the Master Plan Implementation um, plan itself. It, it provides direction on how we're supposed to be implementing the plan. I feel that at times we're sort of disjointed and all over the map with what we're trying to accomplish instead of focusing on one objective uh, or maybe two primary objectives. We've got all objectives. We, you know, we've got seven goals of MPEC right now. And I feel, I, I realize that they do need addressing to some level. But really, what is our main objective as a town right now? And it's really focusing on Littleton Common and the sewer project. Um, and I feel that there is, we've got the Littleton Common roadmap, which actually gives us a revitalization plan. And I don't see what we've, how much we've relied on that roadmap to implement um, those recommendations. I know that we, the Housing Trust is up. Um, it, that's going really well. There's a lot of great information and ideas coming from the Housing Trust. So the housing piece of that also ties into housing for Littleton Common. Um, but it's regarding the sewer project itself that has been recently, um, we've partnered with Light and Water Commissioners on that. We're trying to get with them to have a meeting with them to figure out what, we're, what we need to start <coughs> driving that project forward. Um, and so as far as public outreach and educating regarding the common, I just don't feel that we're quite there yet. We still need to have meetings with the stakeholders um, and get everybody at the table and feel, figure out how we want to see that move forward. Um, and as, re as far as funding goes, I just wanted to ask, we've spent, um, we've allocated $179,000 to implement the master plan to date, of which 151000 has been spent so far. And I just would like to have a summary of what exactly we spent that money on. I know we spent, um, we allocated $80,000 for the roadmap, of which we spent $76,000, but how much of the roadmap have we implemented outside of housing? 
Um, I think there really needs to be more focus on the common roadmap. I know that there's goals in there of the Board of Selectmen, uh, the Highway Department, the Transportation Advisory Committee, which were listed as high priorities, and they do directly relate to the sewer project. I'd like to see more focus on those initiatives because I think it's really important um, that we do that because they relate to the sewer project. You know, part of it is providing a funding mechanism for business owners, which relates to form-based code. We can we can vote in form-based code, but how how can property owners afford to do that with their properties, unless we maybe offer them some sort of funding mechanism, which is which is referenced in the roadmap. Um, the other thing too is back in May of 18. Um, there was $10,000 that was requested for the Littleton Station area public forums. We didn't spend all of that money. Um, so I was just wondering if maybe we could use some of that money for these forums that might be planned. I don't th well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I respond? Yeah. I mean, I, I want to make sure your list is complete. Okay. I, so I just, I'd like to get, I guess the bottom line is, I'd like to get a better handle on the funding and what we're spending our money on for implementation and what we've accomplished to date with that. Um, I'm fully on board to all of Chase's comments regarding public outreach and education. I think that's really important. I just don't think we've formulated that vision yet to see what exactly that looks like. Um, and there might be funding that we already have set aside for that purpose that we could utilize. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just would like to get a, a better handle on that. I'd like to, you know, have a meeting with the water commissioners, have a meeting with the planning board, figure out how we're going to bring this all together, bring all the stakeholders together at the table and, and come up with a plan for the sewer project and revitalization of the common. Um, so I, I think we need, there's a few more discussions that need to take place before we really decide on the direction because the direction should come from the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board. Um, we should formulate what we want those public outreach forums to look like and then rely on other towns and other boards and committees and departments to come in and, and see how we can utilize them for those purposes. Um, I just, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we all have a concerted objective, uh, because without sewer, there's a lot of things that we want to see for this town that aren't going to happen. Economic development's a big piece of that, and we know that. And actually, in the in the common revitalization plan, they actually had some great statistics in there and numbers about you know, what, what it will look like if this sort of business comes in and what kind of revenue that could generate. Like, we have a lot of that information already. I just don't think that we're utilizing the roadmap, the common roadmap to, to its fullest capabilities at this point. Mr. Chairman, may I have <clears throat> Well, uh, I want to respectfully not disagree, but I, I would say that, that there's, during the summary, it's a, it's a summary. Um, let me just make it very clear that the, the common, as far as the committee and I'm concerned, is that m most of the things that you have just cited that, you're, that you, you, you haven't seen yet actually are either have been going on for some time. And I'll just, I'll go through it just a few. First of all, um, through various pathways, including the uh, uh, Serene Task Force as well as MPIC, uh, we made contact with uh, practically every property owner uh, in the common, and this this goes back for quite a while. And MPIC took a different uh, tack to it. We were just not just merely interested in not merely interested in the in the sewer, but interested in stimulating uh, development. That is, if you had the sewer, so what? Who's going to make the move? Well, <clears throat> at least two, and I, I'm not going to go further than that. At least two. One has made has made their public position very clear by presenting what they have in mind. That arose almost entirely through the good efforts of the sewer ta tasking force and MPEC. These are anchors, and anyone who does development in a uh, <clears throat> in a neighborhood as I'll call it as large as the common, uh, you need an, at least an anchor who's going to set the pace style wise, style wise, and also investment wise. 
That doesn't mean everyone follows in with the same level of investment. It means it's an indication of confidence. And it's been understood from the beginning that such, a, such an anchor was needed. And since they've made their position very clear, I don't mind saying that Northern Bank, which owns a considerable strip, uh, contact with them has been cordial, friendly, to the point where they have presented a rather detailed plan. And if I don't know if you've seen it all, but if you notice, it bears a striking resemblance to what is in the <clears throat> what's in it, what, what's basically almost identical to what's called out for in the uh, roadmap. Number one, number two, the stimulus for doing the you, in order to have to move forward with any of the utilization, re, different kind of utilization of the current property, the zoning change had to go in. The the zoning changes have to be made and made consistent with what we understand so far what the town wants so far in the in the common and the level of density at least as far as you know it to your point has been as it were we we know the upper so far from those who are engaged who are interested we know their upper upper level of tolerance of density this is important one of the first things you've got to get straight no matter what the neighborhood is, what is your tolerance, upper tolerance for density? You start going at that or past that, it falls apart. Now, not everybody pays attention. I'm not suggesting for a moment. That's one of the reasons we're, we're for forums. The other piece of this is that as the roadmap shows that the money's been spent on the fire, the bulk of the money that, that has been spent using both town money and frankly, money coming back from the state or our tax money coming back to us, has been spent on developing one thing and one thing only for the common, and that is the roadmap, which, as you pointed out, is detailed. It also contains something else of value, which I think you rightfully might have picked up on, and that is it has economic impacts analysis. Now, this is not a, an academic exercise. This means a great deal. Most of the town managers and mayors I've talked to so far since I started this are turning their attention to doing that. And some interesting conversations arise from that. We have such an analysis in our hands. We know what the impact, we have a very good idea. If we go this far, this is what the impact could be. Who's and we? When we know it for a particular Who's we? Soft. And you say we know. And the town knows it. It was, it was given several times about what it is. It's approximately at full build out. If, the t if we stay below the toleration level, we could expect a minimum, and, a, and we used it as a small model. We were stayed conservative. We didn't try to do the entire common. We took the piece that, very frankly, I can say Northern Bank owns, <laughs> and one or two others that I know the owners have expressed an interest, have gone further than that, and want to do something different with their lands, either in combination or by themselves. Conservatively, if you just stay at current levels of assessment, let me be clear, we did not try to boost everybody's assessment up. Just leave it as it is, somewhere in the million dollar a year. Now that's, not, that's not a lot of money, but that's a small strip. Right now, there's, as a set value, there's something on the order between, I would say, leaving out uh, the area, the land on which IBM sits, it's about $8 million worth of, of assessed value in a, in a piece of, this, of, of, of the common. Now, I, I'm not saying for here that's going to go up to 15, 20 million dollars, but certainly it's not going to stay where it is. It's going to go in the other direction with the sewer in. And that's because the owners who the, the sewering task force approached, that MPIC approached, in, in individual conversations, have indicated the scale of their plan, what their intention is financially. Now, when you say what the town wants, and this is the other piece of it that has to be understood, this is private property we're talking about. There's, we can set the terrain, we can set the table, but we can't say, oh, you must have this business in. You must have this stairwell here leading here. There are limits to how much under zoning that we can do. Right. And, and simply saying what the town wants, and I think Chase said it very nicely, that we may not get everything we want, but by using the technical tools that are available and the regulatory scope that we've got, we could begin shaping the terrain that fits what the private property owners want to achieve with their up to this point more abundant properties and what the town wants to achieve. So in, in, in terms of ongoing activity, MPIC has been in touch with the stakeholders in the common 
who control the property. Try to understand and try to come to a discussion with them through, and it was convenient, I have to admit it, it was convenient, the door opener to this is the sewering system. So can I just interrupt you, Mike? Sure. So MPIC had, how come the Board of Selectmen doesn't know about those conversations? I, I just, uh, I, I think we I have guess, a different. I mean, I'd like uh, yeah, to know who yeah. MPIC's talked to and what conversation has taken place. Who charged I, you with doing it? Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me just put it this way. Um, we have a difference of opinion. I don't know if it's, it's right across the board. I'm no, sorry. No, I was going to say, I, I feel very informed. I was at the uh, breakfast last week with the LBA and, yeah. the, uh, yeah. and the Rotary Club sponsor. And it was, and it was nothing new, it was, but it was nice seeing the coordination between um, uh, the Northern Bank putting a real face on specific plans that are based on things we've been briefed on a hundred times from our consultants about the form-based code approach, and then specifically um, help me with the name of the consulting group. Uh, it, it was it was it's basically you 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 for you tealed four points. Anyway, four the, the, yeah, yeah. the notion of, of taking the facades from various uh, buildings in the common area and making that a uh, you know a, a something you want to encourage folks to incorporate into their development uh, plans and that's you know, rather than being forced on people it's, it's suggested and it was it was evident in the uh, in the plans that uh, Northern Bank has and the room was full there were probably 30 different property owners there on a, on a uh, uh, snowy morning and they're they're following up the same things we heard about at the fire department the same things we heard about at the planning board uh, meeting right here and uh, I mean, the good news is it's going forward on its own organically, which is kind of what we want to have happen, I guess, once we've identified what those goals are as a right. community. It's not, we're not going to be able to micromanage every aspect of it, but it's... So I guess my point, so that was an LBA event, right? And the breakfast meeting? Yes, it was. Yeah. 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 So... I mean, yeah, we, we, did, I mean, we didn't sponsor it. No, I just... Yeah, we didn't. Right. But it's a place where... I can meet and begin chatting with you. I just, I think I would just prefer more um, of a dialogue between MPIC and the Board of Selectmen about those conversations. I mean, it's one thing to have a breakfast forum, which I did hear about. James was kind enough just to email me. Sure. I don't think that the whole board was invited to that. Um, but if these discussions are taking place, who are they taking place with? When are they taking place? What is being shared? Because, um, you know, we've got the roadmap, and we do have some information from that, but if there's other conversations that are going on, uh, do we not know about them? The or? Little, Littleton Business Association was getting the same update that we were given at the planning board meeting, a joint meeting, uh, whatever it was, a couple of months ago, yeah. with the added component that Na uh, Northern Bank was also in the room to say, where yeah, we're that, 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 I think that's that. a question, Paul. I mean, that's that's certainly a public forum that Northern Bank and Trust can give give an update. But Mike stated that he's he's reaching out to all the property owners. He's reached out to Northern Bank and Trust and had a nice dialogue with them. That's I mean. There's, there's been monies requested on behalf of the Economic Development Committee. I'm representative of the Board of Selectmen of the Economic Development Committee. Wow. We didn't request $35,000. The chairman alone doesn't charge the chairman of the MPIC to go ask for $35,000. From FinCon, okay. not from that, us, who, who appoints him. That's, that, that's so, a different point that has a validity to itself, but... I've got There's got to be some coordination. We can't right. have. We can't, well, so we've, we've, heard this, we've heard this from us. IBM in the past, where we we need somebody to go talk to IBM on behalf, whether it's the sewer or whatever. We didn't want six different people going and knocking on their door because they, frankly, they get pissed off and they don't want to, they want one point of contact. Um, we've heard it from from other developers. Sam got inundated in the beginning, so we we try to be sensitive to to that as well. Um, with the development of the point. And with Northern Bank of Trust, we want to make sure that we have friendly relations with them. And I don't think that anything, I mean, Jim Wan has demonstrated that he's very willing to work with us on in a number of levels and has had meetings with the town and updated um, us accordingly. And I'm glad that he did this with the, with the LBA because I, I, I see a lot of uh, validity too with the LBA. But I, I don't think that we can have just Individuals, really, uh, that's something that was on behalf of the MPIC, or it was a you, no. Mike, I don't know, but to be going out and knocking on uh, doors of making of a boogeyman out of the MPIC, all their job is, which I think is happening here, is they're here to remind us to do our job. Right. I mean, it's not well, doing it on their own. So but I they guess shouldn't that be was going out <clears throat> on their own and, and knocking on doors. And, uh, 
So I guess that was the whole point of where I started this conversation. In the action matrix for the Littleton Common Revitalization Plan, there's certain high priority goals that have been charged to the Board of Selectmen. We haven't had those discussions. We should, and I would appreciate that feedback from MPIC saying, hey, you guys should be focusing on this. This has to do with the sewer. It's, it's, but with just, those, though, I, I want to make sure that it's Can clear. I just finish one oh, second? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all right. That. I know. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to ask is, do we, they provided different scenarios. Do we vote on a preferred scenario through the, um, the roadmap? Let's go to the roadmap. Am I wrong, Mike? Did it give it? And I'm just, I don't remember. Did no, it it, it, as a matter of fact. Um, did it give us different it, it, scenarios? Given, given the, f the function of the roadmap, the interest here is what we were interested in and what residents of the town were interested in. There's one of the warnings, I mean, now we're going back to, <laughs> to the beginning, and I, I, I don't want to go too far. But no. I want to go back to the beginning and, and just point out that, that one of the things that should be kept in mind is 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 that taking direction fr from the board on certain items makes a lot of sense you do get to set policy i'm not this is not a discussion about that however collecting or understanding what the residents want getting their input is as chase pointed out through forums and personal discussions is an important part of understanding of what is what the town wants right i mean it could be completely different what you folks want now you to, to be perfectly blunt, it's very possible that there's disagreement in front of me about what should be going on in the town as you as individuals. However, it's what town meeting says in the end. Town meeting said the mission of the MPIC was to promote and, and guide, guide the implementation. That's correct. And in order to provide that promotion, in, and I try to keep the promotion down to information forums only. In other words, we're not going around selling, oh, if you do the, the, the sewer to individuals, this and this will happen to you. That's not Mr. what Mr. Chairman, doing. can I just throw out a, a suggestion at this yes. point? Um, I, I, it would be probably beneficial. I know we have a sewer, a meeting with the Light and Water Commissioners to talk about the sewer project. Then we'll be meeting in January for the planning board. As Cindy had mentioned, we had previously scheduled to meet with them on December 2nd. Perhaps we could meet with MPAC after that conversation and dive into some of these more detail-oriented scenarios and discussions that, right. in terms of, you know, communication and, and various other objectives, yeah. uh, you know, I think that would probably help streamline. We'll have a better understanding of what everyone's doing at that point, and it will be really productive in terms of um, working with MPEC. Right. The, the other point I'd like to make is, speaking of the Water Department, uh, MPEC is already in touch with the Water Department, has reached out and just simply said, we understand you're you're going for you're you're the you're the enterprise builder here. Anything we can do to help, including mention forms to them. Uh, we were in touch with I was in touch with the water department before that on water safety. Uh, I, uh, the master plan misses few things that affect the town, um, and we see the relationships among them. It's very easy to focus to silo the sewer to silo this to silo that that is to look at it by itself to to basically forget who owns the property but you can't do that you have to you basically have to be in touch with all of them not necessarily exactly at the same time but in a sequence we've been following that roadmap well but that roadmap that that roadmap that has has been put together is a roadmap for primarily for revitalization of the common, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about how all of these things are intertwined. So within that roadmap, you will see things like housing, you will see things related to economic development. You, so you'll see all of those things. But the important part of going out and doing more of these forums is not to focus on common specifically. The common is only one set of, of, of objectives of the master plan. Mm -hmm. the, the purpose of these forums should be to go out and continue to get, frankly, sell to some extent the things that we want to do, but also get feedback from folks more broadly than just revitalization of the common, right? It should look at the train station. It should look at how we manage our agricultural resources, even things that we're not uh, actively pushing forward because some of them have shorter fuses and some of them have longer fuses. So I, I would hate to see 
a forum that was focused on one topic if, if, or, well, or one, if, even if, one let, subset. Let me turn around a different way. Uh, um, the, the decision, if, if the Board of Selectmen makes a decision that you folks, that the Board of Selectmen wants to focus on the common, I'm not, <clears throat> MPEG's not going to come up and say to you, no, 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 that's not the name. We're quite willing to help. However, I, I think, and the reason I want to go back to the beginning, and, and, and maybe this is another discussion, but in order for MPIC to promote, and more importantly to guide, there's a limit, not a limit, but basically the issue of how much direction we get from the Board of Selectmen is not absolute. It can't be. Otherwise, you're basically asking us to provide guidance to you, yet you're telling us what guidance you want to get and what areas and in what form it should come. There is no, the, the guidance I'm providing you or not providing you, whatever your thought might be tonight, is up to you to use as you see fit given your situation. Uh, as far as MPIC is concerned, we have a total of seven members, which include a member of your board. Uh, and we try to, as it were, go out and talk to as many different committees as possible, work with them. Uh, <clears throat> because if we don't do that, we basically are not doing the job of not just looking at the master plan itself, but any particular project that, that basically c contains as many elements as most of these projects do. Housing, make no mistake about it. Housing and transportation are intertwined. If you talk, every time you build a house, I don't care if it's one person in it or two, it impacts transportation. What do we have in transportation in the town? If you look at the master plan and line up all the items that have high priority in transportation, they outnumber in pure number of items, items, than just about anything else. I, I don't want to take all your time. I'm sorry. Anna, well, I want to close this up, but I'm going to let you speak and I'm going to make a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Anna Houston with the Planning Board, and I would concur with um, what our county administrator has said. Had we not been thwarted by the snowstorm on December 2nd, we already had on the agenda with the Board of Selectmen to have a joint meeting between the Planning Board, um, Water Department, and, and Selectmen to discuss many of these issues, specifically around coming together to identify how are we going to work on this. So I really look forward to having that meeting in January. Um, second point was that uh, Mr. Zeldin made a comment earlier about um, the planning board wanting the Board of Selectmen to decide on this $45,000 that is being requested. Well, I would like to point to uh, page 171 of the master plan that the uh, master plan implementation committee reports to the Board of Selectmen, and that was why I made the request that any dollars requested that were coming through the planning board's budget come through you first to make sure that you all approve them. So if you all decide to allocate dollars to MPIC and they are placed in the planning board budget, that's totally up to you. But I just wanted to stipulate why that request was made. And then finally, um, in reference to the money that I just heard Mr. Zeldin talk about, uh, $1 million in return to, the, to Littleton, I was the vice chair of MPEC during the time that the roadmap was, was developed. And I don't recall that million dollar figure being in there. So I would really request that the Board of Selectmen request MPEC to provide documentation about where that is and how it's substantiated. I, so thank you. Okay, I'm going to close up. I'm going to take the town administrator's suggestion. Maybe we can bring and back in, in January so the, the board can discuss it. But Mike, I want to make a comment that uh, I appreciate everything that's being done by your committee because I can look back to the master plan that probably dates back to 2002 that was sort of shelved. And the only time it was ever used was when certain committees wanted to, wanted to get a point across and they go and say, if you look at, at page 59 and no one's ever looked at it, no one did any implementation. So I, I, encourage, I, I encourage the committee to keep on going with the guidelines that you go in and to, to help the promotion. I, I love the energy, the, the forthcomingness that you have. Uh, it's a direction that we can take the, your guidance back to us, whether we implement it or not. But, but uh, I, I don't want you to leave here with any idea that this board doesn't appreciate what your whole committee's doing. And when we meet again, we can, if there's anything to iron out, then we can probably try to iron out. But right. no, no way, at least myself, am I negative toward 
everything that you've done because I see it as a, as a positive force going forward that we can grab onto, latch onto, and move on in different directions from there. Good. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Okay, we're falling behind. I have us at four. Mm -hmm. Public. I have us at public input, public Mr. Input. Chairman. Yep. Uh, any public input? Seeing none. Input from members of the board. Let's start with Chase. We have a few uh, more applicants through the Affordable Housing Trust that we voted to approve um, and assist with, which is uh, really exciting. So I think more word, the word is spreading about that uh, resource for the community. And so we were, we're happy that we were able to help uh, um, some more local residents with um, some rental housing support. Uh, the other thing is with respect to the space needs, we have, we're expecting some more information to be coming forward in January. Um, we had a preliminary discussion with the architects and they uh, presented us with a few scenarios um, utilizing all the information that we have provided to them. But I know a lot of people have been asking about space needs and when, when we can expect to share something publicly with them. Um, with that project, so that will be coming forward in January. Up to this point, as I, we touched on at our last board meeting, there hasn't been really anything substantive to share that would have made sense to the public. It's really just been data gathering and fact gathering. So uh, we expect something to be ready for the public by the end of January. Thank you. Mr. Nichols. Um So we had a an event that happened up at uh, Great Road and Constitution Ave uh, where there was a diesel spill and I just wanted to do this to not only our fire department but the, the uh, mutual aid departments uh, and also the police department and all the communication that went out from both the police and the fire department to let people know to avoid that area and also keeping us updated on what was going on with that yeah. um, Something else. Oh, just um, on the agenda is something re relative to uh, HCA negotiation updates. Just take this opportunity just to just say um, we've gone through an iteration with um, the two retail establishments, and town council is reviewing the negotiations to you know, in draft form um, to take a look at you know, where things are at. Um, I do have uh, some meetings scheduled with each of the, the applicants this week and have a meeting scheduled with G7, who's the testing lab uh, this week as well. So just an update there. But you've got guidelines that you're comfortable with, what are you, you're working with council? As far as the negotiations, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah I think it's something that, uh, well, obviously bring it, the negotiations as, as a draft back to the full board. But uh, I think uh, it's, as far as the HCA is concerned, there's not a whole lot. I mean, we can't, there's, there's a lot that we can't do in the HCA. Right. So it's kind of, Kind of spoken to a law, right? It's so. very much spoken to a law, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, great. And, uh, so you expect what early January? Uh, think, that? Yeah, so? yeah. I would say that um, the first meeting in January, and all likelihood there'll be something in front of the board. Terrific. Thank you. It's a glitter. Nothing. Not me either. So we'll move on. Application for change of manager for all alcoholic beverage license. Chapman doing business at Masala Bay. Sorry, we're behind time. I just get criticized for taking care of all the other boards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Good evening, Cheryl Gould. I'm representing uh, Masala Bay, whom you have licensed as Japman Inc., which is the name of their corporation. They're doing business as Masala Bay. This is our uh, Carmen. Carmen Inder Gill, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, she is the director and secretary. She's, um, she and her husband together own Jatman Inc. And they have been operating since December of 2016. Uh, a wonderful restaurant, great addition to the community. Their manager that was licensed is moving on and she's been there and she's doing the management and so she's asking to be formally uh, substituted as the manager. I think we have one small uh, housekeeping and I think that is when the 
when Japman Inc. applied for their renewal license, I believe that um, the licensing board, the ABCC, had a typo in the word Japman. And uh, Diane and I talked today, and we're going to take care of that on the paperwork that follows. The spelling issue. Yes, just to, they, they wrote Japman Inc., and I've confirmed with the corporations department M -M. and the ABCC that Japman is the correct name. Okay. Any comments you'd like to make? Yeah. Boyd? Yeah. Well, I see that the uh, police department's weighed in, that they're happy with activity now since uh, seems like a while ago we had an issue there, but you guys have been yeah. great about responding to that. And, and uh, with an internal transition, we just want to have continued success. Thank you. Same. <clears throat> I'll move that the Board of Selectmen vote to approve the application of Jabman Inc. doing business as Masala Bay, 501 Constitution Avenue, for a change of manager from uh, Navpreet Singh to Harmanander Gill for its all alcoholic restaurant license under MGL Chapter 138, Section 12. Second. Motion has been made and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, very Thank you for your patience. Thanks. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Item number seven, joint meeting with the Finance Committee A, internal control presentation by Clifton Lawson Allen. Welcome. Cindy Napoli. How are you? Good. Very festive. <laughs> <Jump> the coast. <laughs> oh, I didn't even notice your time. I didn't either. <coughs> I don't think he started about the new guy. an hour and a half ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Not too long of a day for you. Um, so I know this is, is um, a report we've been trying to get to for a while, and once again, the snow um, impacted the last meeting. Blame Joe, right? Yeah. Did you open the snow? Oh, I'll yeah, and we're supposed to get more tomorrow, I guess, but nice. at least it was today. Um, I just wanted to kind of review first um, what we were doing with this report, and then um, it's really up to the board's discretion as whether you want me to actually go through the report or just answer questions you may have regarding different items. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm up for whichever you know, method you prefer to go. Um, so as you know, the board um, requested that we come in and do a what we are calling a finance department assessment. I know um, it had been referred to as an internal cro control audit. In my audit accounting world, the word audit is a very different thing. So in essence, we came in to review the internal controls policies, procedures um, surrounding the finance department. Um, there had been some turnover. There had been some issues that had come up in the past. Um, new financial system. So it was all really just a good, a good time to have it done. Um, so I commend the board at being willing to spend the money to do the, the work to try and help the new finance director start off on a good, you know, good foundation with her team. Um, I'd also like to first point out that the staff members, um, the management, everyone I discussed any of these questions was, was all very forthcoming, very willing to talk. Um, you know, my impression was that you guys have a very good team working here now. Um, so, you know, kudos on whoever hired them all. Mm. <laughs> um, so, in, in essence, what we did was we came in, and I, a, a team member of mine who actually was going to try and come tonight but ended up having a, an urgent matter he had to take care of, um, came in and we interviewed each member of the finance staff. Um, we went through what their job duties are, what their, um, you know, how they do those duties, um, if they have a backup, uh, what kind of policies and procedures they have around it, if they're written, if they're unwritten. Um, uh, on top of interviewing all of the finance department, we also interviewed the um, town manager. We also interviewed the former, sorry, a town administrator. The former town administrator I was able to have a phone interview with, and he was you know, able to provide me some, um, some of his thoughts. 
I did reach out to the assistant town, the former assistant town administrator, um, a couple times, and we just weren't able to connect. Um, and so I, you know, I did try that. I didn't want to hold up the report any longer, though, um, in order to try and get, you know, his comments in there. Uh, I will say the former town administrator, most of the concerns that he had brought up in our conversation have already been addressed before we had even, you know, had had this started. A lot of these concerns had already been taken care of um, by the current team. Um, so, as I said, we walked through all the processes, the responsibilities, who's doing what. Um, you know, I also try to come in with a bit of a, um, I always kind of leave that open in a question, you know, kind of at the end of each interview is, what, are you, what do you see as the concerns? You know, because the, the people who are actually in, in the business doing the day-to-day -day work, you know, they're sometimes the best resource of telling you, um, you know, what, what might be going on, what concerns they see, what, you know, they have the resources they need, if they see, you know, questionable things that might be happening. Um, so I always give them that open-ended time to share their thoughts with me. Um, as I said before, you know, the, the employees were all very engaged in the process. Um, sometimes coming in and doing these assessments can make, put people on a little bit of nervousness. Um, I didn't see any of that here. So I think um, it was a positive experience all, over, all around. Um, I guess that's kind of just the, the little bit of a background for how we prepared the report. Once we went through all the interviews, um, my other consultant and I sat down, we went through, you know, compared notes and went through and organized the report in the, in the structure that you now see where um, we put the most important um, high priority items at the beginning and then worked our way down to the less pri you know, lower priority items. Um, I will say some of those, especially on the lower priority items, those are fairly common for smaller um, towns. You guys have limited resources. You have limited employee, you know, number of headcount to do things. So it, it's, it's not uncommon to have people who are, you know, playing two different roles in a community this size. Um, so it's not always that you can, it's not always possible to segregate everything, but you can um, instill additional controls to try to minimize the impact of that lack of segregation. So um, so at this point, I'll just leave it to you if you want me to actually walk through these or if you would re prefer to just ask questions on specific points that I brought up in the report. What's the feeling of the board? Maybe get some input from FinCom too. Gary, anything? Um, no, I mean, I've, I've seen this, I've had it for a while, so I, I think it's, I'm glad it's you know, being out on LCTV, I think it's important to, for the community to see some of these findings at least, and it's available to the public. Uh, but, you know, the new team has taken care of a lot of these, um, I guess, I don't want to call them infractions, but things that maybe weren't being done appropriately, and they've, they've kind of corrected a lot of the, the new policies that are in place are going to fix a lot of this. And there's still obviously some work to do. Um, just, and we're going to have to come up with some ideas on how we want to do it with limited resources, that's all. Okay. Specific questions, if you want to take that tack, I will leave the direction. Okay. Why don't we go that way? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, great, um, in this respect, uh, easy to read and understand financial uh, analysis report. So that's what I mean by great anyway. I think it's uh, thorough and um, um, spells out particular problem areas and um, and uh, uh, appreciate that. And I just as much appreciate, and I'm sure everybody does, um, Cheryl's uh, very thoughtful, and I'm sure it was a team effort, two responses that already the 13 items that you picked out as uh, low, high, and medium priority items for um, improvements that are in some form or other being addressed. But, um, a couple of questions I have is just in the, in the uh, and I know you spelled out your methodology in terms of who you spoke to, um, but I wasn't clear as to, you know, this was obviously being driven by a very specific and, and serious incident where we were being ripped off internally, and, uh, you know, it was a, came as a shock in a lot of ways, uh, and I wonder, um, you know, how much of that was um, driving your review of things and how much was just... Um, 
not just, but the equally appropriate exercise of, of anal uh, analyzing control systems in a period of, of turnover. Did, how, how much of this was, was specifically driven in your activity, and if you could detail any of it, um, you know, what had happened with us in terms of the uh, credit card abuse and, and the way it was done over a long period of time and not discovered. Yeah, and, and you know when we started this process, and actually when CLA first came in and was working with the town, um, was prior to any of that coming out, um, the situation that occurred with the prior finance director. And when we started this process and the interviews, while we knew the basics of the situation, um, due to it still being under investigation, we didn't have all the details of it. Um, so. I would say it's, it's a pretty balanced, it was kind of balanced where we knew that there was this issue, so we're, we're keeping a, um, our eyes open for any other issues that we see pop up. But at the same time, it is also a fantastic exercise to go through when you have new staff turnover, whether there is a, um, a bad situation behind it or not. Um, and also with the new finance, um, financial system being implemented, um, the, the, the two, I would say two things that popped out really quickly, one being the credit card um, policy. You guys have already taken care of this, you know, that those internal controls where now the finance director no longer has a credit card. Um, as far as that goes, anybody, and now with the new P-card system, which was actually implemented in just the last few months within the new financial system, every transaction comes through there. Everyone gets reviewed by a different level of approval, and it's, I think the, the, the takeaway from the prior situation was that one person had too much authority and there wasn't any oversight on things that were happening. Um, I think you have already taken some really good positive measures to keep that from happening again. Um, hey, I can I just add a, ask a follow-up on that point? Now, we've been audited annually for, you know, forever. Every year. Every year. And... Uh, why wouldn't an ordinary audit process catch, not an individual, but a flaw in the system that even allowed that to happen? Do you um, have an opinion on that? Since, since yeah, it wasn't I mean, on your watch, so you're, you're right. free to offer whatever you feel. And, and, um, and in all um, you know, forthcoming, I'm not an auditor. I'm a, uh, a, pra I'm a practice person, so I do consulting. Um, I'm not a, what you think of it as an auditor, a financial statement auditor. Um, what you have had in the past is a financial statement audit. Financial statement audits are not necessarily going to catch smaller internal um, issues. Oh, yeah, um, I've seen that many times when there were, um, I actually at one point was the city auditor for the city of Lowell. Um, after, right before I had come, there was a situation where there was a theft happening in the parking you know, receipts, um, and they asked the same question. When the auditors are auditing your financial statements for their correctness, they look at a threshold. So most of this stuff happening would have been well below that threshold of being material. Um, so now, typically, when when our firm is doing um, audits, we will do d you know different reviews of internal controls and procedures and ask certain questions. But um, you know, I, I don't know what your prior auditor's uh, procedures were. So I can't really give an opinion on that, so other than to say that. The threshold is key in that, well, yeah. I mean, what we consider, you know, whatever, it was a quarter million dollars, but that was a quarter million dollars over years. Years. So we don't that, have right. review and when processes structured to catch that kind of stuff. Right. And, it, and when you're talking. Um, well, nobody does, but do they? And any, any, um, any audit is going to do a sampling of data. You know, and so if it doesn't specifically catch one of those, um, you, it's, you know, sh you could sit and go through what are your policies, and then you do a sample to make sure they're being followed, but it's just a, a sample. They can't possibly test 1,000 transactions, you know, 2,000 transactions. It's, 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 you know, at the very same, same time period that this was going on, we're getting AAA bond ratings in praise for our having uh, written financial policies and following, uh, following them, and we're... You know, it's just kind of embarrassing, and you wonder where the, uh, you know, the reality lies. Should we believe believe any of that stuff, or is there anything we can do? Are we at a level of scrutiny that we is as high as we can be, um, or, 
or what? I mean, do we just react to specific incidents at this point, or, or what? I mean, I mean, I think it's well. Number one, doing a an internal review like this is good. Um, one of the things we also recommend to, um, and a lot of auditors are now putting it in their management letters, is to do uh, risk assessments on an annual basis. Um, for instance, we have one client that we go in every year and rotate different departments and do basically this type of thing, but on a smaller scale, um, and reviewing each department's you know internal policies and then are they being followed. That's not typically part of, an, of a financial statement audit, so it's kind of a secondary piece to it. Um, but it helps to allay the risk uh, involved with you know, some of these things that might not be caught with a normal audit. Um, some larger organizations actually have an internal auditor, what they call an internal auditor, that will go out and do these things. Um, it just depends on the, you know, the organization, what they're able to do um, with, the, with what you have. You know, like any small town, you're going to have limited resources with, as far as people's well, time. We, we would hire an auditing firm every year, so I mean, right. yeah. I'm not, Which I, I yeah, having debt, I think you're required to, but yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And one thing I would just, I know your question was directed to CLA, and, and if I could just, for mainly for the purposes of the public, and I, I know the board knows this, um, the the situation we found ourselves in when that theft was occurring was that we. As, as Hannah had pr mentioned, that was a situation where the individual had access to a credit card. That has been terminated, and there's no credit card access to the person, in this case, our Director of Finance and Budget, Cheryl, who is responsible to review all the other organizational transactions. Above that, I'm responsible to review Cheryl's transactions. So there is a check and balance now that perhaps didn't exist before, which is different. Um, and granted, the reality is that... Well, we haven't seen really that stated anyway, that, it, that the check and balance is any different. Uh, we had a check and balance theoretically in place before. I mean, this occurred before you watched, okay. so there's certainly none of this is a, sure. a slight to you. But uh, sure. I, I just, you know, okay, so this time it was a credit card. If it's something creative next time, what's different mm -hmm. about, our, and I'd say structurally, you know, I'll, I'll ask... Old, is you know, it I mean, some of the recommendations that Ms. York and her firm identified are exactly those places where there wasn't a, a check and balance and we're trying to to create a layer of yeah. uh, verification there. Well, but rather example, than dominate more of the time, I would just ask, again, uh, CLA, since you're here and, uh, you know, you're a fresh set of eyes, t t two thoughts that came to mind. One is something that actually both Chuck and I had mentioned a number of times is, is obvious as... Uh, Changing the audit firm every couple of years to have new eyes in there doing the auditing. Uh, do you have a professional opinion on that? Or maybe a long-term contract somewhere, I don't know. But uh, is, is there a, a norm to that? Um, I, I mean, I, no, we, we do have firms that we, um, I mean, towns that we do our audit side of our, our practice does, um, has done for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, what they do try to do, um, as opposed to switching audit firms each time, is um, every couple of years changing the entire staff that's on there um, and changing the focus of um, specific you know, practices that they do. And we're constantly updating our, um, you know, the, the, the roles that they're taking within the audit. Um, Are you familiar at all with the, I mean, this is anecdotal that, you know, there's a, gee, every three to four years you ought to, you ought to change your auditors. I, I mean, I do know that there are um, some groups that recommend the change of auditors. Okay. Every, um, I've Paul, heard. If I may, I think um, when I, I sat in on the, with the, the state, uh, with the IG, we discussing a lot of this, gave a presentation of Massachusetts overall in, in these, these audits that the municipalities have. It, it, was very clear, it was surprising to me to find that under 10% of these auditors catch something of this magnitude because it's, they, it's really getting down, unless you're doing a targeted audit on small credit card transactions, for instance. Um, so you really look counting on the safeguards you put into place, which are people, and if those people that's the failure here, yeah. right? So People and policy. Well, well that, that brings me to the absolute last point I'll make, and I Gary, you and I had a brief chat about this the other day. It, it's actually bringing the, back to where the town historically used to be with one of the uh, financial positions, 
And until we consolidated our finance department, created a finance director position, along at that time we brought the treasurer in from being an independent elected position. Uh, and I think the fear at the time was that, well, unqualified people might not come along. Anyway, I think what was lost in it that was important to that function is that was, there was a natural tension. That, that individual did not answer to anyone else in town hall other than the voters. And assuming you had somebody qualified, they had their independence of mind. And just knowing within the financial office that there's... You know, there's a check and balance between the people on the team and the person that's, you know, on their own team. Uh, you know, that I guess at the time we made the change away from that, I didn't give enough uh, thought to how important that may be. Uh, do you have an opinion on that at all? You, I mean, that's really outside of what we were doing with the yeah. support, but I can just say overall, um, and it's in multiple places in the report, I think one of the most important things, and you now have a really good um, software financial package that has a lot of capabilities that will help with the um, uh, what we call mitigating controls for any risk areas that you have. Um, <coughs> for instance, uh, I think I talked about it in, you know, historically there had not been support for transactions that were being made in the system, um, reclassifications. Um, sometimes the departments that were involved weren't even, um, you know, we couldn't find support saying they approved or were okay with the transactions. Um, one of the things you have in your current system is a scanning capability that is um, controllable by security settings that if someone's making a transaction, they can scan it directly into the system. And it is actually, um, because of how the layers of backups and things like that, it actually fits the IRS regs for um, being able to retrieve you know, original documentation. So you don't necessarily have to keep the originals. Um, so I think having that in there, having always someone else with a second you know, a second approval, like the person who's entering shouldn't be the one posting it. So I think that was part of it too, was um, the, the former finance director was making entries, posting them herself, and no one ever, you know, the assistant wasn't doing it. So part of the recommendation would be whether um, Michelle looks at things that Cheryl's posted or Cheryl gives it to Michelle to post so that there's a, that second set of eyes. Um, you have the ability in your current system to do workflows. It's all digitally recorded in there and can't be, um, you know, can't be deleted um, without really going through your, your software provider. So, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of mitigating controls that you guys now have implemented that you did not have before. Um, not to say that, you know, something couldn't happen. Unfortunately, things happen. Um, we've seen it before, you know, in other communities. It's, you know, unfortunately... It's just unfortunate, and I know it can be really hard both emo emotionally and um, monetarily for communities to deal with a, a situation like that. Um, hopefully that helps. Thank you. Um, this may be more a question for Cheryl than, than for Hannah, but we'll start with you, Hannah. Um, <clears throat> a number of your recommendations here involve adding layers of review, um, layers of feedback, layers of layers. Um, but some say that our processes were inefficient. So how, what I'm concerned about in the long run is I, I don't want to boomerang from the, the extreme we're at where there, it was very efficient but also very easy to abuse to the other extreme where we, we're 100% that there's no abuse, but we can't do anything else right. except make the system happy. How many understand how your recommendations strip some things away, right? Right. They actually go to efficiencies, and some of them add additional layers. Are we adding more than we're taking away? Are we keeping it balanced? Are we, are we going to regret making this less efficient? Um, I mean, I think it, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. And there is, there's, there is that magic balance. And you have to work with the staffing levels that you have, the, um, the budgets that you're capable of doing. Um, yeah, in a perfect world, we'd all, you know, we, I would love to be able to say, hey, I really wish you guys could hire like two more staff members in the finance department. And you know, and, and only you guys know what that ability is. But, um, for instance, your example of taking some things away um, is talked about in the um, the purchasing 
um, the current way that you're doing the requisitions and the purchase. And currently, it's being done where every single item has to be on a requisition and a purchase, or it was at the time that we were doing these interview that every requisition has to be on there. That can get really onerous when you're talking about someone going down, you know, needing to buy $50 worth of, um, you know, office supplies, or, you know, maybe that they get a bill in the mail, um, and I see this happen a lot where they say, okay, we have to follow this rule exactly to the T. They get an electric bill and someone enters a requisition so that they can pay that electric bill against it. But, you know, some of those things just don't make sense. And Charles, um, were you seeing noncompliance with those things that were just sort of counterintuitive or just onerous, unnecessarily onerous? No, I was actually seeing a lot of compliance <laughs> and a lot of frustration. And so yeah. that is one of the first things we did relax when I um, <laughs> came in here because it was creating a ton of work for individuals and departments, department heads, and then the assistant town account as well, too, and really kind of slowing down the process unnecessarily. So um, people were really good at complying with that. Um, but it just it created way too many inefficiencies. So we did relax that uh, rule that he mentioned. Yeah, and, and typically I'll see it either like $500, $1,000, whatever your comfort level is for that threshold of what. Um, I mean, the purpose, the purpose of a, um, the requisition is to hold that budget until the time the product or service comes in. Um, when you see people putting in a requisition for a bill they already have on hand, that doesn't make sense because you don't need to reserve that budget. You already have the bill on hand. Um, so you have to put a little bit of that, um, you know, what, what makes sense into there. Um, as far as the, you know, like having Cheryl or Michelle, someone reviewing um, requisitions before they auto post, um, this can actually save time in the long run because then you're not making corrections after the fact because people think um, items are being charged to the wrong place. So if you say you change that threshold to $1,000, there's not going to be as many of these little onesies, twosies um, requisitions coming through, but they're looking at anything that's over $1,000, making sure it's being, you know, if it's going to a grant, isn't it allowable type of expense? You know, same thing with revolving fund or if it's um, general fund, um, you know, that you know, say the school departments, and I'm not picking on them, but only because I've seen this elsewhere, school department is buying textbooks under a para's expense line because that's where they had budget, not, you know, as opposed to where does it really Give them apply. any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm just saying, that's why they're going to, she's going to stop that. Um, but, you know, that that's the idea of it is, is um, stopping the problems before they happen. Um, but then at the same time, I think what, uh, what I got from a couple of the interviews was that because the um, PO process had been so onerous, um, some, you know, it was felt that sometimes the credit cards were probably being, you know, used more often than they should to circumvent the purchase order, pro you know, policy. So um, the thought is if you loosen up the PO policy, then perhaps the, uh, you know, and then to kind of tighten up the what type of um, expenditures are allowable on your procurement cards, then that'll help streamline the whole process and cause a lot fewer errors in the long run. In the long run. Um, there certainly are some items in here that will create a, a, a higher um, workload. And that's one of the reasons why we do a, um, you know, saying what's high priority, what's medium priority, what's low priority. Um, because, you know, you may not be able to implement every recommendation that we have. Um, so we want to make sure and focus on, you know, some of them are, you know, like the first one is you, you don't do that. So that's not, that d isn't causing any more work for anyone. It's just, you just create a policy. Stop this isn't wrong. done, right? Um, you know, don't shuffle money around to try and save it for a future year. You know, that's not how, how it's supposed to be handled. Um, you know, but then other ones will require, like for instance, number three, the, um, really splitting out the HR department from the finance department um, to create that segregation duty. So that may invi involve, if you were to do that, needing to have an added headcount. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasonings why it's important. Um, one of the um, research that we were looking at online said that I think for they rec uh, one of these like time, it, I mean one of these business magazines recommended that for like every 200 employees you have an HR generalist. Um, you know, no, I know when, if you're including the school in there, you guys have you know well over 200 employees, but currently you don't have one dedicated HR person. 
Um, so, you know, there are things that will create, um, you know, the need if you want to fully implement it um, to make, you know, have an added headcount if, if that's what's required. Um, or you may be able to do, you know, a partial transition to it. Um, one of the other ones that we found that was, you know, I think part of the implementation process was the permissioning issue, and that one was one. I didn't wait to write up any report. I went straight to Cheryl and said, hey, we need to fix this, and we got it fixed immediately. Um, so the whole process as I went along, you know, if anything was an urgent fix like that, you know, I talked to Cheryl immediately. I wasn't going to wait, you know, two months and, you know, seven people have access to, to records they didn't need to and more than likely didn't even know they had. Um, but it was just part of the implementation process. Any other questions? Um, and, I mean, I guess I'd just leave you with, um, you know, like I said, I, en I really enjoyed working with the staff that you have here. I think you have a, you've um, put to get back together a good team. Um, I've worked with Cheryl in a prior location. Um, she's, she's a rule follower, a stickler, so... I think you're in good hands, um, and we're more than happy to help with any of the, you know, any further projects you may have for us, or help with any of these implementations. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks. You Thank you. A compliment, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nina, before we move on to the next thing, should we take care of the, the gravel thing? This yeah, we, we certainly can. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how, um, how, how much time were you thinking you would need for the next two items? Depends on the board. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go with what you said. Yeah. I don't intend to be chatty on the next two items. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. So falling behind you, I want to jump to item number nine, which has to do with the gravel removal process that was at 64 Spec Pond Road. Council? I would recommend that the board move to reopen and immediately continue the soil removal hearing relating to 64 Spectacle Pond Road. So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, open. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Misunderstood. Cheryl Gould for Seth Green. Um, last time we were here, it was my understanding from the board that you wanted Mr. Green to do a couple of things that he could do immediately given the weather conditions and then to follow up with engineering studies so that he could stabilize the site for now and then have a full engineering report of existing conditions and um, strategies and things to do to correct anything that would cause drainage problems. So Seth reported right away, I believe, to you, uh, Nina, that he um, did go back and stabilize the site, reinstalled silt fence that had been removed, and um, sent pictures to verify that. He also said that he hand dug down to make, I forget how you put it, Chase, about the well and the tape. And he reported back that he did that. He said, um, He said, we dug down by hand four feet without finding the tape as suggested by the water department, nor did we reach the water line at any time digging the trench. So those two things that we could, he could do immediately, he's done. He's not here tonight, I apologize, because he had rotator cuff surgery about 10 days ago, and he's not up and about yet. He has engaged Seth Donahoe of um, Dillis and Ducharme and Dillis, Dillis and Mish was their old name, Ducharme and Dillis, out of Bolton, recognized engineers in the area. I spoke uh, directly. Not Russ. Pardon He's me? not staying with Russ? Not Russ. Okay. Uh, he had Seth, mentioned Russ at the last meeting. So. Oh, no, he, he engaged Seth Donahoe. Seth was uh, Mark Donahoe's son. Mark was very well known to this board yeah. and passed away, sadly. Uh, the Donahoe's sold the business to Hancock, and Seth has moved on. He's now with Ducharme and Dillis in Bolton. And I spoke to him directly, and he tells me that he has uh, started the work. He told me, weather permitting, he'll be able to do much of the work. I don't think he was completely um, apprised of all the work that needed doing, and I suggested that 
he get the minutes from our meeting the first time to understand exactly what you meant? And I will make certain that he has the way to download the, min the audio and actually hear the mi meeting because I had email correspondence back and forth to make sure that he addresses the concerns that this board had and that he sees it firsthand and I'm not just paraphrasing it. In, so all and to be clear, place. so his scope of work that he put forward here is a, an existing condition survey and you intend to disabuse him of that notion that it is much more than yes. just a, an existing yes. condition when, survey. Yes, when I saw the initial email, I responded to him immediately that okay. it was a lot more than that and he needs to see what the, boards want, the board wants. And I think he wrote to you, Nina, and asked you, uh, for some information, which there was an email chain this morning, and, yeah, the, and I think he just needs to watch the minutes. Yeah, the letter on the court that's contained in the packet for this evening indicated that he was looking for correspondence on this matter, and I wrote to him today and asked if um, the minutes were sufficient because truly we have no other correspondence right. and supplied those minutes. So, um, I think the correspondence he was referring to is the complaint letter that, that initiated all of this. But when I saw that email to you, I wrote him back and said, I think the more uh, important thing to look at would be the minutes of the hearing because I think everything was said there that yeah. he needs to know. I think, yeah, exactly. The actionable items are in the minutes. Yeah. So that's my report, and I think that's what we represented we could do at this point in time. Um, Sean said he's, and, and Seth said they're going to get to work on it right away, but. I asked him if you can do what you need to do in the snow, and he said not really. So if we have more snow tonight, it's not going to be right away. It's going to be as soon as the ground and weather conditions permit him to get out there. I guess my only fear is what he put up will, will keep anything from leaving his property onto any neighbors. I can write Seth in the morning and make sure that he, he, he thinks that that's sufficient. And if not, we'll fortify it. Okay. Any public comments? Todd got your 62 Spectacle Pond Road. Um, I got a certified letter in the mail the other day that Mr. Green's property is being foreclosed on and auctioned off on January 10th. So where is that going to leave all of this? Um, I appreciate the comment, Mr. Dutcher. I've spoken directly with Mr. Green's bank and Mr. Green um, without going into the uh, you know, personal finances of Mr. Green. Um, the bank tells me they're in the process of working with him on a mortgage modification on this property. He has other property with equity in it. This property has equity in it. He has the means to stop that foreclosure if the modification that they're working on is not approved. And I understand all of this is a result of a recent divorce and some um, dispute over who was supposed to pay the mortgage. And I, I have that information for Mr. Green, and I've gone far enough with the bank uh, and with checking the title to the other properties he owns to be able to say to this board with some confidence, oh, and also talking to Ducharme and Dillis, to say to this board with some confidence <coughs> that the financial ability to solve this problem is here, and there is no intent on having that property foreclosed. That foreclosure will be stopped. Do we have any means? Any, any, any? Yeah, I mean the the board. If the board yeah. wished, the board could write to the mortgage company and indicate that there's an ongoing. Um, any kind of lien or anything like that. Though? I don't. I don't believe that there's any type of um, legal means to address this, but I can certainly request clarification from council, but <clears throat> we could write to the mortgage company on this subject that we're in the I process would imagine, of hearing. I would be interested to hear what council would yeah. say. I would think the mortgage company would be bound to uh, to hold up any legal uh, obligation that he's under. Well, I'm not necessarily commenting on whether or not the this legal obligation transfers to a future purchaser of the property, more so commenting that if the board wished to notify the mortgage company of this earth removal hearing and the matters around it, it may provide a slowing of the process if there was a, um, an intent to foreclose. Because banks are typically please. not interested in it. Did, when town council was present during our last uh, meeting when this subject was discussed, did he mention something about a bond, that we could impose a bond? 
He did, um, and this board, I mean, could definitely impose a bond in terms of the soil removal bylaws at, and we'd have to take a look at the, some of the language there, but I don't, I, I don't, I'd have to seek council's opinion on how that bond would interact with a scenario of a trans, I mean, if we're talking about a transfer of ownership, then I don't know yeah, how that would. Yeah, I wasn't would, referring okay. to that. Um, My recollection is, did the bond scale with the value of the work? Yes, yes. yes. I believe so. <clears throat> and, and here, I think really the, the value of the, the reason it's going to be expensive for the property owner actually has less to do with the, the permit had it been pulled in the first place. There would, there would be essentially nothing to bond if it was done right the first time around. Um, the real ex financial exposure here is the work to bring it back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, it, w it would be complicated to figure out whether we could even compel them to bond that, that okay. going backward, given that the actual value of the bond, given the amount of soil, is actually pretty small. Okay. That's my off the cuff, don't have it in front of me <laughs> analysis. But All right. That's it. <clears throat> Any other comments for now? There's no. There's no well, you'll look into asking council. Well, I mean, council's council in part, council's already written to us on this subject, and while we didn't ask that direct question, council did indicate that we could write to the mortgage company um, on this matter to notify them about this earth removal hearing. Again, we didn't ask the direct question of whether or not there's a legal method, but I would be shocked if council didn't already supply us. There's no lien in this case that, that we could utilize, to my knowledge. In the event that Mr. Green is not able to avoid foreclosure and auction, where do we sit? I mean, uh, we, if we, I could we answer that. that. We had something that was done outside of what, what teeth do we have to make sure that he makes whole what he, the violation that he made. I mean, this, if, if it was a building inspection and didn't pull a building permit, you know, there's, there's different fines that can be imposed. We, apparently, we don't have those kinds of that language within our bylaws. But I would defer to town council. But uh, I'll, I'll look I, to see if I have his email to the right fullest, now. I would say. I mean, just because, I mean, time's of the essence now, and if January 12th is the date, I, 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 not, okay. not that I don't trust you, Sherry, but, I mean, um, he kind of duped us by doing what he did. You know, it was... Uh, whether he did that to sell the sell the soils and, and just get the, the cash from it, or if he did it to, I, I don't know why he did it, but um, I, I, I don't oh. want to get duped again. Well, I just I just want to go on record as saying Steve Breitmeyer has done an awful lot of business in this community, uh, is well known and and well respected for his integrity. So, uh, Steve Breitner is work Breitmeyer is working with. Um, uh, Sean Green on the correction to the problem, and I just can't imagine that if he, as you say, tried to dupe you or the neighbor, that we would have the reputable people like uh, Bright Meyer and Seth Donahoe working with him to try to Bright Meyer resolve been duped the problem. As well. yeah. I, I just don't think so, but I hear you. Mr. Chairman, um, my question at this point to answer um, Chuck's question really is whether I can break attorney-client privilege and read a portion of an email that town council sent. If the board is in agreement with that, then I don't feel it is anything that would put the board in a difficult position. The fact that you have that take on it, I'm okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is ahead. that more like the Hannah comment earlier? No comment. Um, so council said that we really don't need, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, we don't really need to do anything differently than we're already doing because of this foreclosure notice, although it does add some urgency for our meeting. And he goes on to talk about um, getting, if, if the Greens are in real danger of foreclosure on their property, which, I mean, Attorney Gould has stated what she stated, but the reality is the board needs to make that decision for themselves. And he, he did recommend that we send a letter to Orleans PC, which I imagine is the um, mortgage holder, outlining the open issues on the property and including a copy of the public hearing notice to alert them of this issue, which they uh, may well inherit at the foreclosure sale in January. So hopefully that answers your question. <clears throat> I think that's right. I mean, I think we have to we have to treat it, notwithstanding the fact that this may just be an administrative issue, treat it on a big I have no problem with that. Orleans PC, by the way, is the attorney's office that's Thank conducting you. the foreclosure. And right. 
if you uh, if you were to reach out to them, I'm certain it would get to the foreclosing mortgagee. So, uh, I would uh, suggest in confirmation from uh, probably a vote of the board to uh, ask me to send a letter to Orleans PC as recommended by town council. So moved. Motion made. Second, all is fail. Aye. Aye. And we hope it otherwise gets resolved in the meantime. If um, this foreclosures, when are you meeting again? Thirteenth. Thirteenth. Day after the foreclosure day. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Three days. I will um, make every effort to get uh, notice to this board uh, if and when the foreclosure is stopped. And if it's going in another direction, I'll make every effort to let you know that as well. Sure. Thanks. Thank All right. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. At this point, I would recommend that the board um, continue the hearing. Move to continue the soil removal hearing related to 64 Spec Pond Road to Monday, January 13, 2020, at 8 p.m. to be held in room 103 of 37 Shattuck Street, Wilton. Right. Motion has been made and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now back to item number 7B, fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget discussion. I hope everyone got their Christmas presents that I left on your... <laughs> <laughs> Christmas present. Those lovely black binders and some light it. reading. <laughs> Um, so in the, if you flip open, open the black binder, there is um, just some slides there. I just thought I would um, review those just to give a high level um, of uh, your budget books um, that I'm sure you'll be really interested to read all the way through. So um, pictures. there's some pictures in there. A few pictures. Uh, so, as I had highlighted um, in a memo I had sent earlier, the budget process and philosophy was a little bit different um, this year. Um, you know, outside of undertaking the zero based budgeting, we also, all available um, funds and revenue are presented in your budget. So, the um, numbers that you're seeing might look a little different than what you're typically used to seeing um, at this first juncture. Uh, so just a high level um, overall operating budget is increasing about 5% or $1.5 million. We did have a number of budgets that grew less than 2.5% though, uh, which I did want to highlight. Um, and there were some that overall um, decreased. So comparing amended FY20 budget to FY21, um, we had about 15 of them that overall um, actually decreased, which is almost a million dollars in decreases. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> some went up, some went down. Um, one of the big highlights is the creation of an HR department and an HR budget in the proposed preliminary budget. Um, another uh, thing that is contributing to the increase are a number of requested um, FTEs by uh, different departments. Uh, one thing I did want to highlight with this budget is that the employee benefits line has the requested FTEs built into it. So when you're, you're looking at those numbers, know that as of right now, um, anything that's been requested, we've built into the employee insurance line. Um, and even with that, that budget is only increasing by 3% um, versus last year where it increased 12.7. And so a a reason behind that is we shifted a lot of the costs that were traditionally there into the HR budget. So when you look at the HR budget, it's a new budget, a lot of the costs have come out of that employee benefits line and contributing to that small increase. Sure. Can I, can I make you explain that again? I'm not sure I totally followed. Sure. That. So <laughs> the, um, a lot of the costs that ended up going into the HR budget came from the employee benefits budget. Okay. And so therefore, even though we've added um, additional FTEs into that, you're still only seeing a 3% increase overall. Okay. And that's because costs have shifted out of that budget line. Okay. So traditionally, that budget line has seen over 10% increase. This year, it's only at a 3% increase. Even with 
even with the added FTEs. So okay. between shifting costs around, um, things moving into appropriate budget lines versus just kind of being in a, in a big um, employee benefits line, um, that's contributing to that. So when you're seeing small budgetary lines increase, try and keep in the back of your, your head that some of this stuff was kind of embedded in this employee benefits section. So you're seeing a much smaller increase there because of that. Gotcha. Thank you. Right, right, Cheryl, so that would mean that probably years to come it'll kind of go balance back out to where it was, though. It, this is more of a one time. Uh, one time <laughs> lessening of the pain. Right, adjustment, and then it, it will probably tip. I mean, we like these kinds of one time adjustments <laughs> rather than the other kind. But. Right, and so, you know, and I, yeah, I will say that, you know, we'll see this kind of level off, but it's probably going to take us a couple of years. So you're going to be kind of be seeing things shift around a little bit for the next couple of years um, as we really figure out where the um, thing, where the budgets, true budgets are. <clears throat> uh, total revenues are increasing by 8.74%. Um, the vast majority of that is the estimated free cash increase. However, local receipts um, are increased a little under $200,000. Um, like I mentioned before, the major driver of the expense increases are the FTE requests. Um, as of right now, um, the three-year financial forecast is predicting um, a somewhat um, significant or need to be addressed deficit if we fund the budget as it stands today and kind of continue on through FY24. Um, just for your reference, the, all the assumptions built into the financial forecast are on page 25 of your budget book. And as we turn to capital, uh, we have $6.1 million in uh, preliminary requested capital requests. Um, one thing I think we've discussed a little bit before, but um, there was things that were previously uh, voted as capital that really are operating expenses, um, and they don't actually fit into the capital definition as defined in the financial policy. So $80,000 was moved from capital um, now into uh, various departmental operating budgets. Two items to note, which there, I believe there's some wording up on your screens that we do need to make a decision or the board needs to make a decision. Two of the items that were highlighted for this on the school side to move into their operating budget was their technology for 135000 and their resources, i.e. book curriculum materials for 100000 Right now they've kept them in the capital plan and are awaiting this board's decision on where they would like them to lie. Um, as of right now, the budget has approximately $2.7 million proposed available for new capital projects. 800000 of that comes from raise and appropriate, um, and proposing $1.9 million come from free cash per the financial policy. Um, the two largest uh, capital requests come from PNBC, as you'd probably expect, um, about $2 million, a large project from the, for the high school parking lot paving, um, and then the police station repairs. Please note that they haven't actually been formally voted by PMBC, though, yet. They were just requests by departments. And then PRCE has a large, couple large capital requests as well that are um, about $2.3 million. I just wanted to highlight for you, too, some information on free cash and reserves that are um, in the budget. Right now, we're estimating about $8.5 million in free cash this year. Uh, just a reminder that that's only available for you to spend through June 30th, this June 30th, and after that, it's not available for expenditure. Uh, right now, the proposed uses in the budget for that free cash are $1.9 million, as I mentioned, for capital. 2.1 million going to capital stabilization, 150,000 going to general stabilization, and about 718,000 going to OPEB and retirement. And again, this is just following your financial policy and going through the formula that's in your financial policy. Remind yeah. me, Cheryl, with those, are there ranges associated with those allocations, or are those? It's a percent. Percent. Okay. 
Um, so if those uh, transfers do occur, we do estimate about uh, 8.65 million in total stabilization funds at the end of FY21, or about 16.5% of your operating budget would be in reserves. Um, and just to add in the school reserves, they have two reserve funds, um, school choice and circuit breaker, uh, which will be about 2.5 million in FY21, or about 11.5% of their operating budget as well. I'll take a breath if anyone has any questions before I go on to next steps. Yeah, uh, the number for the sewer project of 50 million, where did that come from? That was just a, uh, when Steve and I were looking at it, it was just an estimate on what we might possibly spend on it in that, in the FY21. It's not the total cost of the project, it's just how much we might need to possibly ban in FY21. Okay, so that's more a product of what might be banned as opposed to what might be voted? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. it's just what, yeah, we're trying to figure out if this project comes to fruition, what in 20, what would be the impact just in 2021 mm -hmm. to the debt service budget? And so that's where that number came right. from. It's just a portion of the, the project that we might need to ban. And it's just... And so we're, you're really looking there at the, at the carrying costs of that debt. Right. So um, as far as, you know, next steps is getting the free cash certified by DOR and then, you know, having the elected boards uh, make their spending decisions as it relates to free cash, because um, that will, you know, have a trickle-down effect. Uh, making your capital recommendations, um, determining really uh, what of the FTE requests you're going to approve, and like I said, those have uh, impacts not on the departmental budgets. On the salary line, some impact a lot of expense lines, and then, like I said, our insurance line. So, um, you know, really trying to hone in on what the boards uh, want to approve there will be helpful because it will have uh, ripple down effects in other lines in the budget. Um, and then, you know, looking at what the board wants to approve for uh, departmental budget requests. Uh, we have the meetings, two meetings scheduled in January, January 14th and January 21st and then the meeting on February 1st. I guess what we never had happened yet, which we'll have to have happen then, is our, what should have been preliminary discussions with our departments so that we can hear what they were planning on putting in the budget if we didn't already know their budget was done, and then we could give them feedback as to what we'd like to see included. Uh, but that's kind of all going to have to happen after the fact now. I like very much the changes and the reforms you've made in the process and in the presentation. Um, very easy to follow, but I still think we got an issue with having Here we got this more, more of a... In advance, right? We'll, we'll start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're getting that as early as we've ever gotten. I'm just saying the part of the process that hasn't worked and no fault of you or Cheryl is we need, to, we need to get our own departments in front of us to talk to them about what they're plans are and what our priorities so, are. So how early would you, would you like to see that? Because I mean, that's what January is for right now. Well, that's what it used to be September was for. Years ago, they'd come in and talk to you. You know, uh, here's what I'm, I haven't, I haven't drafted my budget yet, but here's what I'm thinking of asking for. And then, huh? That's, that's quite a draft if you're, if you're, you're, you're talking three or four months ago. Well, that's what used to happen. And you know, you'd have a conversation. So before it got drafted, and then they would submit their drafts to the, in sometime in October. Uh, I, I don't even I don't think there's a problem in, in my mind with the timing as much as the the chronology. What what should happen before before a budget's drafted? Yeah. A department ought to go to their uh, their elected officials and say, "Here's what I'm thinking of putting in my budget. What are your priorities?" Okay, our priorities are X, Y, and Z. But, if you're reacting to a his the his the uh, right down to the FTEs requested and the line items, then you're just you know you're 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 playing at the edges. I guess it's just a different philosophy. I mean, I haven't seen that since I've been involved. So it's been a while. Yeah, sure. well, you know, I I think yeah. So I, guess it, record, it was I guess much, that, it was pretty much a norm for the longest time. Well, they, you know, they'll come forward with their requests, 
and in January they're going to have to answer the hard questions from your board, <laughs> yeah. as well as our board on it. You know. Well, we were at least we won't really be in a position we were in last January where we were reading the book yeah. <laughs> on the day of and finding out what our departments were requesting in real time. Yeah. So. Uh, I guess that can be a discussion. I, I think we could probably talk. Well, it's really a discussion for the board, how we want to manage our departments, uh, yeah. that relationship. So. And if there's action that the board wishes for me to take, I, I need some more direction on that. Well, I, we discussed it back in August, but it just never got on the agenda to have the departments in for that purpose. I didn't realize we were this far along, or they were this far along in the details when we hadn't had those conversations. But we'll, you know, obviously we'll deal with it as it is and, uh, and focus on the positives. It's a very uh, good structure, easy to, easy to follow and react to and with us, before us in a, a much earlier fashion that this book ever got to us, uh, this part of the pro process. I don't know when that stopped, Paul, but it, it has been a while. I mean, no well, more than a couple of years. It's, it's before my time. It's only a couple of years in my yeah. life. Been with the no, I'm just curious how that, how did you find that that worked as so far I, as the budget get, process I asking, goes? I, I think what I'm trying to get at is where, where are you, what would you say to a department head in that meeting? Like, what are, they, what are you trying to guide, I guess? I mean, your vision of your the FTEs or what what I'm trying to figure out like what what that early meeting in September does it whereas the department heads this is what what we want this is our needs or, or okay wants. so you got department heads and yeah. they work for you you hire them. sure no absolutely and, you, and you, you have a meeting where you say okay the budget season's here what what are your goals for the year what are you looking to achieve well here's what I'm looking to achieve they give you a memo in advance it may not be down to dollars and cents and then you know since you got it on the Friday before you can formulate your own well you know what I'm hearing on the communities we ought to focus on this that and the other and then there's some modifications made before anything gets put into numbers I mean it's not such a, a an odd mystery it's like this is you know uh, but how would a department head know what to ask for if they haven't got some dialogue with their uh, appointing board as to what the board's looking for how do we know what they want yeah, if they I, go I ahead and draft? Us, I mean, we liaison, as you know, each one of us has a yeah. liaison with the board, so we meet with them, so we, we get that. I'm just trying to find a Yeah, was... parallel to that, there was always a process where I'm sure Park and Rec commissioners have had a conversation yeah. with the Park and Rec director. I'm sure uh, Council on Aging, you know, or whatever. That hasn't happened here for police, fire, highway, you know, town hall, whatever. Uh, hmm. You know, it wouldn't be hard to recreate. No, not, it isn't. I just, I'm just trying to figure out that those earlier meetings wouldn't be. You, you're not going. That book is is a. That's right on time. I like. The yeah, line. yeah. That's I'm a December book. To what, what, you know, my complaint is not what's hap happening in so, uh, December. It's what didn't happen in September or October, right. whatever. It so you're not asking for this in September. No, that's what no. I'm trying to. No. Okay. That's oh, right. before, before, this, before this before this is created, how did these folks know what it was we were going to be directing them to do with their departments? They didn't. Well, I think there's also another perspective of looking at it, and this is just, it really depends on how the board wants to go about this. The, you know, the other perspective is this is a preliminary document and can be modified to More whatever extent. Document. Well, it, I mean, it, it was listed in the um, memo from the finance department that this document would come out at this time, and it was listed that there would be a final document in March. It can be modified to whatever extent the Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee wish to modify yeah, okay. it, and the final product can be what is is going to be what is presented at town meeting. We, we talked specifically about doing this earlier in reaction to what had happened last year, and uh, that didn't it didn't happen. Right. So, to, so, just to follow up on that, Paul. So this actually getting this information now actually does coincide with our timeline. But the only piece, the only step that I guess we missed was having the departments come before us um, and just share their ideas, their thought process, so that we as a board could give them feedback. But this in itself is right on target with what we've been trying to achieve. Sure, I'm just saying yeah. an, an earlier significant point, unless you don't think the, 
the dialogue between the elected board and the departments is important. Uh, I think it is. This well, is a great document, but this kind of presumes that we're kind of superfluous. Exactly. So I well, don't think it does. No, I, mean, I, I, I have no re, no objection whatsoever to tearing out pages of this and saying no, nope, not doing that. And I understand that that could ruffle some feathers, but that's how I view this. And but it shouldn't have to happen that way, right. Chase. Before something's drafted, there ought to be some some. And, they, and I'll, as I'm saying, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I'm proposing anything odd other than last year we were off track specifically for you know for some specific reasons but it wasn't uh, too far be before that one that was basically the norm right uh, and that may be the case and I mean going forward I think I, I would prefer that structure as far as I'm concerned I would rather walk before we run and this is this is us walking. This is, run, this is running. The walking part was the part we <laughs> yeah, didn't do. Well, I'm just, I'm just yeah. Now you're mixing the metal. This affects, well, I don't think it affects <laughs> our timeline. You're, you're specifically talking about your department heads coming yes. to you. Yes. This is our vision for the year. This is what you're going to see in our budget. And you're going to say, well, that doesn't match our priorities. Correct. Or it does, whatever. And then, but I, I, my question to you, do you like the timeline of this? Uh, this would problem. this would yeah. probably come out the same time. It might look different, for sure, perhaps. I, I'm all for giving you, you know, you know, leeway and latitude to play around with all that part of it. You know, whatever. Every every new set of eyes does that part of it differently. I'm just saying, what uh, a little fundamental piece that's not so little didn't happen, right. and so, it was talked about. So just as an, so, I this is great. I mean, this is the presentation of the information. The way we've been getting information is just exceeded my expectations I just want you to know that yep. um, just but as an example to Paul's point one of the questions so one of the line items here regards uh, field design on a piece of property um, that we have I don't think we've had a consensus Cooper Farm a consensus with that department about that field and what's going to happen with it because unless I lost track of it and maybe there was a consensus but so that would be an example of when they would come before us ahead of time and we would have that discussion instead of having it already incorporated. And then we could either be, yep, agree with you on that, thank you for bringing that back to us, or no, you know, we haven't really hashed that one out yet, we'd rather you focus on this. Right. But those conversations but the, need the to happen. The counterpoint to that, though, is that it, it's very easy in September when there aren't dollars associated with anything to say, yeah, that sounds great, why don't you put it in your budget? And now... Now there's a, a certain amount of presumptive uh, approval yeah, for it. This, uh, I can say, okay, what do I think of $1.5 million for this task and how it fits in the context of everything else? If we're just looking at abstract ideas in September, it, uh, it creates an unrealistic uh, set of expectations. Nobody's criticizing this book, and I think yeah. going overboard to... Uh, oh, uh, I mean, it's obvious a discussion between department heads and, and the elected board ought to be the beginning of a budget process. Right. If nothing period. else, to align our goals. Exactly. Right. So that was one of the things that I had circulated to the board. I don't know if you guys looked at it, but I did align the requests with the goals of the board of selectmen in the master plan. I had sent you out a chart. Um, and that might be more along the lines of what you're, you're yeah, thinking but it's, about. Paul. You know, it's, each individual may have their own, you know, what they consider priority that's being overlooked or not being treated right. as we've discussed or whatever. Right, and but for our purposes, for the discussion maybe, purposes. Maybe something we have to take care of next year. Yeah. Well, and, it, and, and for everyone's consideration for next year, we'll take whatever direction the board wants to take. Um, one thing that we might need to consider is more meetings. If we're looking to accomplish this, we might be talking about a lot more meetings. Well, I, I think the structure not, of the meeting I, is I another no way to accomplish that. that too. I think we end up spending a lot of time at the meetings on busy work. And uh, that Trying to, I think uh, uh, it, it might be a good idea to go back and look at uh, achieving time within, you know, these agendas. But that's not a, you know, that's a, a longer conversation we're going to have tonight. But I, um, you know, I, I don't think automatically adding meetings is the only way to achieve that objective. Happy to have the discussion. <laughs> Another way that could potentially be done is similar to what FinCom does. They have, you know, we're, each one of us is assigned to a different department. Right. But it still should come back to the yeah, it'll come back to the full right. board, but it doesn't necessarily have to take up time. Yeah. I mean, in fact, that, that used to happen too. That was that one. Yeah. okay. We can move on. Okay. Before we move off of this item, um, 
There's a recommendation that uh, we, the board, vote to request that the school committee move circul uh, curriculum materials and technology from the capital budget to the operating budget. Because this hasn't been able to happen through discussion. So this gives, this gives the teeth. Sure. So um, in the books, I can probably speak, <laughs> you know, for the finance team, that absolutely it needs to move. And in, in, in our opinion, it's one year, you're, you're not going to stop giving books to your, your students. So I, it becomes part of the operational budget. It makes sense. The, the technology one is still, because if you look across, you know, the nation or across Massachusetts, how many, we, there's not a whole lot of, um, it, it's new, it's fairly new to how we we utilize this technology. We're talking about um, Chromebooks. things like that. So how is that? Could you theoretically one year just say, no, it's a capital, we can't do it this year. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just saying, but there's different, that's just me talking. There's thresholds, you know, that Cheryl can speak to that of why she feels it should absolutely be moved over to the operating budget. There's, it's still a little bit of a gray area, and that's why I think the board needs to, you know, vote to, to move it because I don't think the school committee is going to do it from us, you know, request this. So there's got to be some sort of rules of engagement, right? This is right. certain parameters that you set that say if this is something that we need, absolutely need on a day to day basis, it's part of the curriculum, like a book. Right. Um, that's. It's not a capital expense. Right. And so this... But this something we can depreciate or right. that, that has, has a different threshold. Three years, depending on it, or five right. years. So uh, when the school went through the items that have been traditionally voted in those two articles, because uh, they couldn't really find anything that fell within that capital definition, but they wanted to ensure that the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen were on board with it and approving that and also ensuring that the funding was moving with said articles as well too so they wanted to ensure that um were they invited the other night there's just a joint meeting with the fincom selectman out, out school committee um i know we made them aware that the meeting was occurring um yeah. I mean, but it was it wasn't a tri-board meeting I, at this I point i just think we're likely to have more success if we do it conversationally rather than having a vote and telling them what to do, knowing that they have autonomy under the law, that if they wanted to dig in the heels, they could do what they want. I think their, their concern is more that the money moves with it. That's obviously the big concern. And I think they brought up that uh, it wasn't too long ago that we moved it to capital. That was the <laughs> problem. <laughs> so I don't, know where, I, I don't know where that took place and why, but I mean that, you know, they didn't dig their heels in then when it, we... Right, okay. Well, I don't, so. But I would say rather than just sending them a vote and mailing it to them, why, why not have a conversation? Yeah. You know? And I, I don't know, um, this, it, this vote probably doesn't have to happen this meeting, then, if that's the case, does it? I, no, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to happen at this meeting. Maybe I think after that, we meet. I um, think that this is going to assist in terms of the finance department being able to enforce the policies that the board has set. This is consistent with the board's policies. And we just, and you can modify this motion in any way you wish or take it up a different night or not take it up at all. But in the end, um, in order for us to follow the policies, we need some some confirmation from the board of selectmen that you, you're you confirming your policy of having those criteria be what is defined as a capital item. And that's all this really is. And again, you can modify this anyway. Policies aren't exclusively as a joint product. And the financial policies booklet and the committee that works on it is two members of the selectmen, two members of the finance committee, and one member of the school committee. So uh, once again, that's a product of a dialogue. Uh, I, all we're going to do is piss somebody off by sending that off. That's all. It's yeah, I mean, that's my take. I, I very much want to enforce the policies. I'd rather, I'd rather do them, and just make sure the school committee's sitting here and says, "Yep, yeah, thumbs up. Sounds good to us." Yeah, I mean, did did it did you know, maybe like, they should hold the vote on what they think? Maybe, maybe did anybody talk to them yet? Sure. We've had that. many conversations sure. with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, them being who at the, at the administrative level or Kelly, Kelly Crunchy, Mike Fontella, yeah, and. Um, 
Steve Mark. And Steve Mark. Were they, they, they refused or they just? Nope. No. Okay. Not at all. It was just a, a discussion. Cheryl was kind of pointing out these things, and not just schools. We're talking about them right here, but obviously all the department, some of the other things you've seen move from capital to operational. Um, but specifically, we wanted to hold a meeting with them because some of these were significant. And um, they had taught, this is where this discussion came up. But they also said that they, their, like I said, their biggest concern was the money moves with it. And they wanted, obviously, your take on this as well. So they asked for our input? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The schools did. So I mean, perhaps since they're asking for the board's input, the board can at least come to a consensus on what its position is. It doesn't have to vote on anything for sure. That, that, that's just sure. That seems a little too rigid. I just say, yeah, convey to them that we we would appreciate very much if they're able to do it because we're trying through Cheryl to institute a uh, new system and that incorporates old, you know, policies uh, that they're already, you know, whatever. And, and and uh, if they can help do that, great, do it. But I mean, it ought to be a little, you know, this looks a little too formal. So, so consensus on that? Yep. Yeah. Great. I've got three members. Thanks. <laughs> Next item. Did it? Uh, Unless there was anything else on the budget. I didn't mean to jump that too quickly. No. Mm -mm. Great. Thank you. So, those two meetings in January are going to We're meeting. Yes, assuming that there's a quorum of the board, and hopefully there is. Uh, that's the 14th and the 21st. And each department head will have 15 to 20, uh, 15 minutes to a half hour to speak to all of us um, at that time to present typically what they would do on the Saturday, but we're giving them a little bit more time um, just naturally because we're not squeezing everybody into Saturday. And then we, uh, if we can do it in here, I would like to have us all, you know, maybe a extended tables here. Yeah, I agree. If not, we do it maybe at the fire station where all of us can sit um, at the board and we can kind of have dialogue with each department head. Um, and then there's a schedule that will be come out on the 14th of this. these are the department heads that are meeting. It's going to be a long night, those two nights, the 14th and the 21st, because we're getting in, I think, 18 departments, you know, in those two nights. Um, some, obviously, the smaller budgets that don't have a lot going on, They'll be the 15-minute ones, and then the bigger ones, you know, the 30-minute. Um, and, you know, I had mentioned there was some concern with some of the department heads after talking with them that they, I guess, didn't feel like they were <laughs> getting to speak to us as much or, or to you as much. So um, either you, us, the FinCom, or the department head, if at any time they feel like they want to come on Saturday on that February and, and present more if there's some oddity going on with their budget that they need more discussion, then absolutely just make that happen. Okay. If that's, if that's, I mean, does that sound some, like something we can do? Those nights, I think, are like 6 p.m. to you know, 9.30 or 10, I think. They're, they're long nights, but I, it's going to make that Saturday a little bit more fruitful, maybe with the larger, the four big departments. At that point, we'll have a better idea of, you know, all the smaller, if you will, departments and what it looks like. All right, number eight, Finance Department Review by Technical Assistant Bureau. Uh, so I guess you all know we have some pretty key staff transitions happening in the Finance Department over the next 12 months. Um, <coughs> and so given that and, and all that had gone on, I had reached out to the Division of Local Services Technical Assistance Bureau to see if they might be able to help give us an outside objective uh, look at the department roles, responsibilities, um, and, you know, just review um, our department. Uh, things have changed a lot with Munis and the needs and the needs of the town and the needs of the department. Um, and so I thought it might be a good opportunity to really have them come in. It's a, you know, free of charge um, to do one of their financial um, management reviews. Um, of our group to see if maybe there's, you know, with the, these two staff members, you know, department, should things be shifting around? Should we be looking at the organization <coughs> a little bit differently? Um, and so um, here tonight uh, requesting that the board um, formally vote, because um, they'll need to formally vote uh, for the Technical Assistance Bureau to come in in around the March time frame. Um, it'll, 
should take um, about between one to three months to complete their work. So um, they have us right now penciled in the queue because they do have quite a queue, but this is one, something that they are very interested in taking on. Um, I know and Anthony had spoke to them last spring about this. I don't know if maybe they were already aware we were oh, I don't know. interested or not. I spoke but, with uh, um, Zach Blake yeah. at the Technical Assistance Bureau. So um, they're excited to come in. They're excited to do this, but it does uh, require a vote of the Board of Selectmen if we so choose to accept their assistance. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so one to three months, one to four months, they're engaged with us. Um, how far is the queue? There, so right now we're in the queue and they'd be starting in March, around March. Okay. Um, what kind of a demand would it put on your department? Um, <laughs> It, I, I expect it to be pretty similar to the, Diana. yeah, to, to that, um, which, you know, is manageable. Um, a lot of interviews, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of, you know, there were probably like an hour to, depending on the individual hour and a half interviews uh, of everyone. And, you know, I think they'll probably kind of do initial set, take information, and then and likely come back. And then they'll obviously be meeting with uh, elected key stakeholders as well, too, through this process. So, um, you know, I think the demands will be reasonable on, on the department. And I think that, you know, the department itself uh, will welcome any and all uh, recommendations because sure. I do feel that they all feel a little underwater. Um, so some, some outside assistance on how we might be able to uh, possibly mitigate some of that or, or set things up a little differently to help them, I think um, they'd welcome. So do we need to vote on this? Yes. Um, I neglected to put a motion there, but I got one that's... Uh, do you have one already? Okay. Uh, and then you can tell me what I said. Perfect. Uh, move that the Board of Selectmen uh, solicit uh, financial management review by the Technical Assistance Bureau. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Cheryl, Thank you. do you know if we have to engage um, our state senator or a rep? I know that they copied them on the Dedham. You include the Dedham report from 2015 or 2013, initially 2015. Um, is it just a courtesy because DLS is part of the state legislature? That yeah, I mean, he, he, the only thing that Zach told me was he needed the official vote from the board and then a letter from Nina saying, asking, requesting the assistance from them, and that was all that was required okay. from us. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if it's a courtesy. No. Do we? I mean, we, we can. I, I, I'm i surprised, to be honest with you, that I'm they're even on. That yeah, I'm surprised they're even on the, that, to be honest. it's um, There's really not that much relationship between the Technical Assistance Bureau or DLS and to my knowledge, the delegation. But um, we'll be talking with them tomorrow, perhaps. <laughs> so um, we have uh, Chuck, Cindy, and I are going to be on that call with regard to the MBTA uh, matter and the expansion of the parking lot. So we can certainly mention it then. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. You're welcome. Thank you. And you too, Gary. Go to Jordan. Turn the phone call. We take a minutes. Okay, item number ten: tax increment financing proposal for the new hotel at the point. Uh, a little background on this: Should I give? You know, approached by Sam Park along with Mark Montanari for an initial d discussion. Just to get an idea whether the board would even consider such a case. And the second meeting was held that Chuck attended with me, uh, Nina, and who else was there? Uh, Anna Mar and Anna. Mar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he sent over a proposal today, and it has to do with the hotel, which is, I guess, in lot five. Six. Lot six, five is the back part. Um, but he wanted to inc include other parts of the development, which would be almost everything else that's not developed. Not developed. 
You want to take it from there? Okay. Um, yeah, so if you look at these. All right, so this is the existing motel, right? Yes. This is 485. So this is lot M on, this, I'm sorry, this is pad site M on lot 6, which is currently undeveloped. This is lot K, uh, I'm sorry, lot 5, pad K, pad J, lot 4. So those, those three pads, if you will, um, as part of those lots are undeveloped. And um, in having conversations about having, I mean, the hotel, the, uh, La France can't, has the exclusive rights to the, any additional hotels that go on that site. It was something that Sam never thought to be another interest in another hotel on this, on this parcel because of the size of it and just the nature of it. So um, he was more than willing to sign that ex exclusivity with La France. <clears throat> And then last year when the France said, hey, we want to put another hotel up, it was a Hilton product. I think it was Home to Suites. They came in and did a presentation. They showed us some renderings, and that's where they were going to go. It's kind of, uh, if you're standing in front of O'Neill Cinemas, right down the end of the parking lot, looking down towards the courtyard. <coughs> Southbound toward, down 45. So they, um, in order for anything additionally to be developed up at the point, um, Sam has to do phase two of a wastewater treatment facility. And um, Sam, as the developer, tried to put some of that cost onto La France. La France did the numbers and said, it doesn't work. We're, and so ultimately, they backed away. Um, they still are interested in, in building this hotel. And Sam wants to try to make it work. The only way that they will do it is by getting some sort of assistance. <clears throat> and the, I don't know if there's other means to do this, but one method it's been proposed is to do um, a tax incre increment fund, TIF. And <clears throat> just kind of talking in round numbers, the new wastewater treatment facility is going to cost about $3 million. Um, that would, take capacity to a level that would service the point, in theory, until the system needs to be retired. But um, it would more than easily handle the capacity for the hotel and those other two developments being built out and also offset the capacity that's being used up there right now. And we might be able to get higher and better use out of, out of that existing location. Um, there's a couple of different ways we can look at this. Option one would be we just do a TIF based upon the hotel being built and just do it on that lot site, on that pad site. Or we can incorporate all three buildings and kind of average the TIF out over the three lots. And that kind of puts a little more burden on Sam to develop those lots more quickly, which gets us more tax revenue more quickly because he doesn't realize any benefit of a TIF until there is something to TIF. So those buildings would have to be built and would have to be charging tax. If we just do the numbers based upon, let's say we incorporate all three, all three sites, the courtyard Marriott that is built, those are the numbers we can go off of just to kind of give us a, a, a glimpse into what it would cost or what, you know, kind of what the numbers are. Courtyard Marriott is currently assessed at just over $10 million, 10, 10 to and change, 257 I think it is. Um, so if you use that number, so we're getting about just under $300,000 in tax revenue, real estate tax revenue, from just the real estate on the Courtyard Marriott. We are getting somewhere in the vicinity of, uh, on average, we're getting a little over $300,000 a year in room tax from the hotel. So not even incorporating meals tax or, or anything else. So roughly out of that property, we're getting about $600,000 a year. Um, if we built, if we allowed, if we, if we decided to help out and make this happen, and we were willing to put a TIF on the table so that we could build that $10 million hotel, we can figure on somewhere around $300,000 in real estate tax. And we can figure out, and I'm just basing that on our current CIP rate. Um, 
and we can figure on somewhere around three hundred thousand dollars as long as the capacity is somewhere uh, the capacity is going to be about a hundred rooms which the courtyard's 115 rooms um, based upon my experience with the courtyard they're banged out all the time their average uh, room rate is about 200 bucks um, I'd say yeah probably an average <coughs> but um, just kind of doing the, the simple math I think you can mirror the numbers from the new hotel with the courtyard hotel and you could probably be a little more conservative even so if we looked at a 12 year TIF we can figure out different ways to kind of structure it um, but in order for us to get three hundred thousand dollars in real estate tax and three hundred thousand dollars in room tax we would need to structure the TIF so maybe we do a hundred percent for the first couple of years because that's when they're going to be looking to recoup their investment um, so we don't charge the TIF would basically forgive their two hundred thousand two hundred fifty thousand three hundred thousand dollars a year in um, real estate taxes so when I do the math it seems like it's worth foregoing the taxes for a couple of years for the long-term um, shot in the arm not only for the hotel but also because it incents Sam to develop those other sites that are not currently reaping us a whole lot in tax revenue so I can get into the numbers a little bit more deeply Sam's got spreadsheets and all kinds of formulas <laughs> but I think it comes down to we can if we're interested in having that hotel built and continuing economic development we've, we've gone through the uh, classification hearings the tax classification hearings we've looked at what the numbers are for commercial development and what our forecast is um, this could help us over the next couple of years and they are looking to do something pretty quickly so this would be something that we would in theory um, be voting on at Maytown meeting um, but they they would be interested in having something open and operational by they say spring 2021 yep spring 2021 to open the doors in the new hotel um i miss anything no i think the only point that i want to ask for your clarification on because i'm not entirely sure about it is i think in both scenarios that sam proposed he's mr park is looking to propose both all three lots for all four lots Three. Three, thank you. All three lots for tax increment financing. Correct? Correct. Just want to make sure I didn't misunderstand. Um, and I, I, I think it, you know, certainly the board needs to, if the board is interested in pursuing this, the board, it would be beneficial to make some decisions on which of the two or if there is another scenario that the, that the board wishes to propose to Mr. Park. Um, perhaps in that equation in that process we could seek the finance department's input on when you know when revenues you know as far as again having part of that conversation that we had at the tax classification hearing relating to new growth and revenues and when they would be expected to come in to try our to do our best if if again if this is a pursuit that the board wishes to follow up on um, maybe the board would wish to have some feedback from the finance department on that as well and, and or the board of assessors I, I think that's I think that data would certainly help us um, to paint the picture you know the, the information I'm giving you is just based on my own research and um, Nina was able to pull up what the what the court is doing as far as um, the information you gave me was relative hotel to tax, tax. Yeah. Yeah, the hotel tax so, um, I mean, certainly more data would help, but as far as in principle, if it's something we want to pursue, then we can get that data. So I'm kind of looking for what the, the, what the numbers are new enough and uh, detailed enough that I'd, I'd value the Census Department review of this just to see if it makes sense and is accurate for starters, and then we get into the whole business of what's in the town's best interest yeah. um, but this is for as a premise which is more Nina's question uh, historically I've been 
um, leery of these, but uh, Chuck and I met with Sam uh, this summer too, and I am uh, persuaded that, the, uh, that for my mind, a TIF is only should be considered if it's allowing you to do something that isn't otherwise going to happen. And I think the case can be made here that that is the case with the with the um, the hotel. The reality so, is that he he is going to do something. To improve the right. wastewater treatment facility, he has to. Has to. I mean, DEP is saying you got to get it done. So when he's hat in hand, he's he's made that statement. So something will happen, but that won't be a hotel. That'll be a pad site like a CVS or right. like some something else, um, which uh, the, you know the, the tax base at that point will be. We could probably look at like the DCU building or, or you know one of the other buildings on the property to find out what the retail. And a hotel has more public benefits than just tax benefit too, so that's that's why I would be persuaded to say, yeah, let's you know be open minded to it and definitely want to pursue, see where the math goes. Mr. Wilson. Yeah, I guess from a resident perspective, Gary Wilson on Wilson Lane. Um, so this the TIF only attaches itself to the real estate tax, correct? Correct. So you're going to be bringing in three hundred thousand dollars of income that the town wouldn't have otherwise per year. It's roughly $300,000 in real estate tax and $300,000 in room tax. Right, so roughly. But the room taxes are not going uh, touched by the tip. So you have the $300,000 plus a building that is full of people that are going to use every other establishment right. there that are going to bring in more money and more taxes. So I think you're going to see, yeah, you've got to be very careful with tips. And I, I, I know Paul's very skeptical of these. As well, but I, um, this, like you said, if you put a CVS there without reaping a benefit of anything of close to this magnitude, this is we're talking 50 homes of you know of tax. You know, that we you'd have to build 50 homes to, to get this tax, and then you're, you're not reaping the same benefit because you've got children in school from those homes. So, it, this is really money that's um, available. I, I'm just Pleased that he would even consider it that this is something that we could do there. It's it's it, it 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 structured in such a way that you know maybe the first two years we give one hundred percent forgiveness, if you will, um, and then the next two years is seventy five percent. He's open. He's open to structural, and he has done models up for us as to what those numbers would be, and you know what the impact would be for us, and um, you know certainly benefit for him from a lending perspective, from him borrowing to build this. Um, well, it matches our two thousand twenty four tight budget. <laughs> that we, we're, we're up against, as you saw in, in that paperwork, and, and Steve's actually talked about in the past, um, where we start to get a little bit of stuff off the books after that. But it, it definitely it sounds like the timeline lines up very nicely with that. You know, some of those 2023. Not to realize some nice revenue on it. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. if it's just the room tax, you hear that's a that's a huge benefit. I, why, I, why are we taking his financial models at face value? They, well, this I is agree. Bullshit. That's what I said. They should be. This is complete and utter I, bullshit. Which is why I didn't give you his financial models. <laughs> I gave you my financial well, model. No, I thought you said that he he put together. I thought they yeah, were his. I didn't present them. I, 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 I'm, I didn't. I, I didn't look at flatly, those. Oh, I flatly refuse to put another three hundred thousand dollars in Marriott's pocket or La France Development's pocket on behalf of a financing structure that fails more than it succeeds. And I'm sure as hell not going to do it when it's based on half-baked models that are telling us what we want to know, and it's based on, frankly, threats that so, say, well, if you don't do this, then I'm going to have to do something else. Again, bullshit. No, He's only got one thing to tell us to Jason, get the test. You, you, you misinterpreted what I said. I never said, if you don't do this, I'm going to have to do something else. He will no, do that, something else. It, that's what he's saying. Threat. He's saying, and I didn't, I didn't present his models. I said he has the models, and we can, we can show those. And but fine, and I gave I'm you happy was to, the numbers that I did apart. sitting upstairs and crunching numbers. So I didn't I come up with the first Sam's thing we agreed numbers. upon was having the RSS department. Yeah, that, we, that's I'd like to have our team. I'm not accepting oh, that. I, I have no manual. doubt. I, I have absolutely no doubt that a, a hotel will you know, generate a revenue that is comparable per you know, room or whatever to what uh, the hotel down the hill generates. That's not the financial model. That's not the consideration that, that's worth looking at. Any, anybody can crunch those. The, the point is that 
TIFs more often than not just move development around to the financial benefit of one party and one party only, and that is the person receiving the TIF. I, you know, I've and, made that argument many mm -hmm. times, specifically in different projects. I do see a distinction here, and as I say, TIFs got a, a high threshold to get me overboard, and and I, uh, I think for for some very specific reasons. He's in a position where the people who have the uh, the exclusive on the hotel are calling the shots to a certain extent, right. and if you know he can build other things, but we lose out. We we make it a wash on revenue, but we don't get a hotel. Uh, you know, and at a certain level, I don't have to believe all his math, but I think uh, you know some of the facts are just right there in front of us. It's that's you know what it is. It's, so it's choices for us to make. You know. Right. Uh, but we're presuming that he, he has no incentive to tell us the truth. And I'm not calling Sam a liar. I'm calling him a developer, right? Yeah. And he has no incentive to, to say, well, if you don't build this hotel, you know, eh, maybe the finances are a little different. We have to go a different direction. What he's saying is, well, if you don't do this, then you have to do that. I'm calling it a threat. He may not use those words. I understand it's not being couched as a threat. But the, the, the threat is if you don't build a hotel, you're forgoing the revenue. And the only way you get a hotel is if you do the TIF. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But he has no incentive to explore other options with us that don't involve us coughing up $3 million worth of potential tax well, I think he has been because he really started floating this about three or four years ago. He's, he's tried this in other... You know, in, with other models. I mean, you don't have to believe it. That's fine. We, and nor do we even have to believe a word he says if we decide the math is still in our better interest to go along with it. You know, it doesn't have to be based on faith. And he's 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 demonstrated to us that he, he is a man of integrity. He's he's up, he speaks to his word. I mean, he, he pointed up three hundred thirty thousand dollars for us to do the sidewalks down Russell Street. You know, in order for us to get the MassWorks grant to get that the matching funds. I mean, so I. I um, I understand what you're saying about a developer, and he's the first one to admit, I'm a developer. There's no reason you should oh, be trusting and, and he has a Oh, and I, I don't extremely. begrudge him his profit motive for a, a second. But that's his incentive, right? The, the profit motive is his incentive. If he can get us to agree to a TIF, why wouldn't he? But if that's the case, then why are we not lining up TIFs for every freaking business in town? Right? It, it just doesn't make any sense. They don't, they don't all yeah. make that same case. Uh, I, I was against the one at IBM. The IBM folks were told by the state to go ask for it. They were coming here anyway. The guys at Pepsi, God, I, I gave them points for honesty. They were, they were more or less, they admitted they were coming anyway, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. it had already been promised to them, so I, you know, I, and I entered the game when that was already uh, established. established so, uh, but it, more often than not, I, I agree with you. I don't think the, uh, it's a high, high hurdle. Maybe you should have a, you know, we should have him in here to make the conversation. It's better for him to make his own case, perhaps, too. After like, we do some more research. Yeah, after we, we do some more research. We don't have to accept his math, but it can be a case. And I'm happy can, to run it through it can the be a case where and, and all that, his, but I'm telling his you. His interests I'm, are irrelevant to us, but if the math makes sense for us, and it's also a case of providing more services that the town may not otherwise get, uh, and we still make more money of it, those, that's, that's, that's where it proves itself to me, uh, but it, it has to prove itself. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and it, 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 I will say no to this all the way to the end, but I will absolutely force us to look at the, the socialization of the cost. You know, we say, oh, a new hotel is great. Cool. Well, there, there's a bunch more people. There's a bunch more services. There's another fucking fire truck. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Another fire truck. Just um, on. It, you know, it, it, those things, you know, the, the, the way that Sam presents it, like, oh, there are no additional costs to the town if we do this because uh, it's... I, he never, yes. he never say that. He didn't say that. Yeah, he did. That's exactly what he said. He, he, he said that it's private roads. They're maintained privately. But he didn't, he didn't you, Chase, to your point, he did not say there's additional public... Uh, Public safety. Right. At, at no point does it account for the, the additional socialized costs of, of doing Police, that. Police, so. fire, right. But he talks about the, the expenses of the public roads and, and schools and, and that kind of thing. So those expenses are not associated with. Sure. Yes. Right. I, I agree. The schools probably yeah. won't see an impact here. But there, there are still a lot of other costs. And until we fully flesh those out, it's a, it's a, a very simple and easy no. And I 
expect you're never going to get me to yes on it. Well, Those well, are valid points. For sure. You're open to this. But, but we, the one thing we started all off in agreement on, we can end on agreement on, is doing our own internal analysis. Yeah, we got to do our own it. diligence on this. Yeah. So just so. Oh, God. Yeah, no. Uh, and I just in uh, planning board, so I, I was in a meeting as well, and one of the things that I wanted to point out to, to um, the board um, is going back to the master plan recommendation number 19 um, identifies that having a policy for the town overall about what we'd like to do about a TIF um, might be a good idea. So um, if I could ask you all to take a quick look at that. Um, because the recommendation does have to re-examine our policy on TIF. And if we don't have one, perhaps this would be a great opportunity to be able to develop one based off of what each of you individually believes and then the board believes should be in any kind of a TIF agreement, regardless of who the developer it is. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank, Thank you. you. I was just going to say that just so I make sure that the board gets back what it's looking for, is the board looking, I mean, I would just take the information that was presented by Mr. Park and pro provide it to the finance department and the board of assessors and ask them to work jointly on um, a review of the information and any recommendations that they may have. Is that reasonable yeah. to the board? Yes. Yeah, and it yes. doesn't have to be exclusively in the four walls of that document, if they have thoughts uh, beyond that, Excellent. sure, tell them to Excellent. think outside of the box. Assuming everyone agrees, I think that's great. Yeah. Right. You know, like, if there are factors that aren't being considered that should be, there you go. Excellent. This is all Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Michael Zelda, living in the land street. Uh, uh, for reasons I won't go into, I've become a bit of a student of TIFFs. Uh, <clears throat> let me suggest, uh, in, in the process of, of having the finance department and others uh, within the uh, town take a look at this. Uh, there, there are, if you take the point of view that you would, take the point of view that you, that the town is going to build a hotel and therefore do a real economic, shall we say, model of it internally. And, what, and that, I don't know if the finance department can do that, uh, <clears throat> given everything else that's going on. This is, you know, an assessment of how you want to use folks. But this is not the first hotel that's ever been built um, or proposed by a developer. It would be very interesting to understand, for example, uh, uh, what is really the market for the hotel. It was, it, I mean, Chuck, you did a lot of homework on this, so you were quite correctly assessing it from um, what the success of the existing hotel is. However, it could very well be in the industry, given where this is, <laughs> as opposed to to where the other hotel is, that the whole marketing of this is entirely different. Uh, I'll just simply cite the city of Cambridge that happened to lay everything out some time ago, just basically independently just hired and went out and contract for someone to say, basically they modeled the construction, the development of a hotel on behalf of the town to understand fully employment levels, where they're gonna come from, the traffic levels, the impact on the schools, the whole nine yards. That's a that's a that's an interesting exercise. That may be more than you want. It's more than we're capable of, frankly. Yeah. But what, what I think what 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 we're worried about here, or at least as a citizen, worried about or concerned about, <clears throat> is that in order to search for, let's say, an alternative that you could throw out to the developer, or an alternative that you would have for yourself, you have to, as it were, know, have the information, the insight of what it means to develop a hotel. Because you're basically going to have numbers, unless I understand, I mean, the finance department may or may not have that capability. And my concern is, is that, as Chase is concerned about, is that there may not be a need given on the market, as it were, for this particular hotel in that location within the point. And I don't want to make more of this than this. I'm just simply saying that this is significant enough, perhaps, to understand What's the impact of this hotel? Not number of people. I mean, there's the whole long list of the models get interesting. The the economics of it get interesting. This is a why back there. I, mean, I understand why it's there, but that's a different story than on a hill in the front of the hotel, in front of the complex as you're driving in. You can see income, 
the income levels between a hotel that's right up front and five stories and another hotel that for all intents and purposes similar, three blocks away, more exclusive and a totally different market. So I'm just saying, take a look. So we have, we have, uh, that's one. I just have, I just have one more comment. It's, if take the tip away, would we be arguing with Sam Park about putting a hotel there? We have some of the same concerns maybe we just brought up a little bit, but I, I don't think we'd, we'd probably welcome it more than we'd be against it, I, I would assume. So well, ideally, it it's really out. having the right negotiations with him on if there's going to be a TIF discussion. We're not a blighted community. We're not in desperate need of you know, the revenue by any means. But So I think we do have some cards here. To, to sit down and discuss the best plan, uh, you know, do I, is it 10 years, over 10 years make a lot of sense? I don't know, but I think some really hard discussions can come down on, on what works for the town, I mean, to our benefit. His, his real issue is hiring in plain sight, and he, re, he admits to it on the fringes, he's trying to find a way to pay for his, yeah. uh, his uh, treatment plan. So maybe there's a percentage of that that we can offer to pay for. I, I, where was in that? Well, I mean, he was very interested in joining the sewer on those terms because he needed to offset some of that debt. We really couldn't justify absorbing it for you know for nothing really. All right. But do another study. And if, if there were, that was kind of discussed on the fringes as well. If there were an opportunity to re-engage with that conversation, and essentially would become. We own that wastewater treatment facility, and would tie into our. Well, you're going to be tying in with not, already treated water. It's just. Uh, no, I. Yeah. I mean, we we've, we've explored those options. I, I mean, I, I have no objection to to linking the the sewer group up with Sam again, but. Um, I mean, certainly we can discuss it uh, yeah, we'll on Wednesday. Uh, I also don't have any intention of pumping any brakes to the extent that we're going quickly. Um, for Sam, but it, if it works, let's, let's, let's see if there is a synergy there. I mean, we've, we've always wanted Sam to participate in the sewer. Sure. But he's on his own... Um DEP permit, and it's kind of, he's already halfway Come, through comes it. down to, it's complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. All right. So you got marching orders? Yes. Murky okay. as they are. Better than, better than uh, I think we would normally come up with in these kinds of scenarios. This is not, this is not a, an easy one. As far as connectivity to this? You can, the ball can join in too. I don't think it should be me. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Sorry, is there, I just need clarification. Is there something further that you're asking, no, the board's asking no, you to no, do? No, okay. All right. We need minutes. To really, what I was trying to do is back out of more responsibility. Obligation. Um, yes. Very quickly, I'm asking for the board to vote retroactively to authorize me to sign the Executive Office for Administration and Finance grant for $20,952 for the Council on Aging and support of Council on Aging F activities as identified in the annually published COA formula grant guide. Hell no. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Then I'd recommend that the board vote to approve the meeting minutes of December 9th, 2019. Do we have a motion of minutes? I wasn't there. Probably, I, mean, I know I don't have to, but probably abstain. Someone else? Any yeah. comments on the minutes? No, I'm good. No. I, I do appreciate the uh, level of detail. Especially I was a little efforts. worried we can't um, sustain it, so we'll see. If there's sustainability issues, we'll let you know. But um, Diane, did a, Diane and Sue did a wonderful job adding. Uh, Providing a lot I'm, of detail. I'm, I'm more concerned with the level of detail for um, the. Thank you. Was, this was the earth moving one, right? No. Sorry. No, that was. Uh, you did a subsequent. Right, that's why. Right. So I'll move that the Board of Selectmen right, vote to approve the meeting minutes of December 9, 2019. Second. Motion made and second for the minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Those opposed? Abstain. Three yeah. eyes. Not going to stand your way. <laughs> Move to adjourn. Second. If the move the second to adjourn.
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Yep. Everyone out there, have a nice holiday. Merry Christmas. Merry Happy Christmas, New Year. Everybody. Bye -bye.